Hello, members, uh, to this council meeting of South Kensington District Council on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, starting at 2 p.m. So, whether you are attending remotely or in person, um, uh, I'm, you're, you're very welcome. My name is Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm the chair of South Cambridgeshire District Council. For this meeting, we'll need to elect a vice chair for the meeting, as Councillor Peter Hay Fain is attending remotely. So I'm proposing that my colleague, yeah. Councillor Judith Ripith, be elected vice chair for the meeting. May I have a seconder? Oh, Forest of Hands. Thank you. Councillor Smith, thank you very much. So, does anyone wish to vote against that motion? No, so, members, are you content to take this decision by affirmation? Thank you very much. Does anyone wish to vote against? No. Lovely. Anyone wishing to abstain? No. Thank you. So, the motion is passed, and uh, we have a, now a vice chair for the meeting, Councillor Judith Ripith, by affirmation. Thank you. So, Councillor Ripith, would you like to say hello? Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for electing me as temporary vice chair. I'm Councillor Jude Ripith and I represent Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you. So, a few housekeeping announcements, members. Please make sure that your microphones are switched off unless you're invited to speak. For those participating remotely, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone and camera are switched on. And then when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone and camera immediately. Please would members who are attending remotely indicate a wish to speak through a chat message in the Teams meeting. Those present in the chamber should indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand. I'll ask uh, the vice chair to note the order of speakers both virtually and in the room, and I will try to ensure that we take people rem attending remotely um, as a priority so that they know that they've not been forgotten. The chat facility should not be used for any other purposes except when necessary to write down a symbol amendment. Complex amendments should have been shared with democratic services in advance of the meeting. When we move to a vote on any item, and there is not clear affirmation, I'll state that a recorded vote will be taken. Members in the chamber will then vote electronically, selecting for, against, or abstain, and the result will be displayed. As has been the practice since we resumed physical meetings, since microphones are on the tables, it makes it rather impractical to speak. So I propose to stand to speak. So I propose that Standing Order 21.2, Standing to Speak, be suspended for the duration of the meeting. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Smith. And does anyone wish to vote against that motion or abstain? Thank you. So, members, are you content to take this decision by affirmation? Agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. So, Councillor, that's therefore agreed by affirmation. Um, Officers have confirmed that the meeting is corrupt and we can proceed. Um, just before we go on to the first substantive item, I just want to be clear, members, I'm liable to be very strict about time today because we've got a lot on the agenda. Um, so I may be um, expecting you to respect the uh, timings. So, number one on the agenda, apologies. Are there any apologies for absence, please? Um, yes. Chair. Uh, apologies for absence have been received from Councillors Grenville Chamberlain, Sarah Chung Johnson, Claire Delderfield, Pippa Halings, Steve Hunt, Tony Mason, Nick Sample, and Ian Solemn. Some members, as you know, are in attendance remotely, and just to indicate those I'm aware of, they are Councillors Peter Fain, Neil Goff, Deborah Roberts, Nigel Cathcart, and Nick Wright. And finally, Chair, I believe Councillor Aidan van der Weyer will be attending the meeting a little later, towards 4 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Councillor Cathcart, can you hear me? Councillor Cathcart? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Would you be so kind as to turn your camera off while you're not speaking? 
um, because otherwise we've got a lovely view of you <laughs> for the whole meeting. No, 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 it's quite a nice <laughs> view of that. Lovely as it is to see you. <laughs> it's off. <awesome. laughs> Thank you. So, moving on to declarations of interest. Uh, do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on the agenda? If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? So, Councillor Heather Williams, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I sit on the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. Thank you. Any others? I cannot see. Goff. Oh, and Councillor Goff online. Yes, um, I sit on the board of the Greater Cambridge uh, Partnership with respect to items 18B and 18C. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. Thank you. Councillor Milnes. Yes, if we're declaring uh, interest, I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Assembly. Thank you. So, Councillor uh, Milnes, Greater Cambridge Assembly. Thank you. I can't see any other hands. Oh, yes. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. I'm also a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Joint Assembly. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's... Um, I sit on the um, scrutiny panel of the combined authority. Thank you. That's Councillor Judith Ruffith. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that's all the interests done. But obviously, if, if something comes to mind later on in the meeting, do um, say. Thank you. So uh, we'll move on to item three, register of interests. Can I please remind members that they need to keep their register of interests up to date and they should inform democratic services of any changes? Thank you, members. Okay, so item four is the minutes of the previous meetings on the 23rd of September and the 18th of October. Um, I propose these minutes to be uh, approved, but I have some amendments myself, and I can see Councillor Smith has, and Councillor Williams, and lots of hands. So I'm gonna go first on this one. Um, I have raised these already with Democratic Services members, but just to let you know. So item page one, under presentation, I wanted to clarify that at our meeting in September, it was Gavin Chapel Bates of Centre 33, um, who gave a presentation, not Circle. Second item is on uh, page three, and it was under item 8A, um, Councillor Williams's report to, uh, to Cabinet. Um, and I, in the third line down, Councillor Williams congratulated officers for coming top in terms of the collection of council tax and near the top in collection of business rates. And I asked for clarification of top of what, if that was possible. Uh, on page 13, under uh, item 16A, uh, under Councillor Solemn's um, presentation. Third paragraph down from the top of the page uh, was reporting what Councillor Nigel Cathcart had said. And at the last sentence, he, that is Councillor, back, sorry, Councillor Cathcart, had suggested that abstraction licenses needed to be reviewed. That's abstraction licenses, not obstruction licenses. Um, and the final one I have is page 15, the fourth paragraph from the top. Again, it was Councillor Nigel Cathcart. And the second line from the bottom was referring to Councillor Brian Milnes agreeing with Councillor Gath Cathcart and adding that many concerns expressed about planning applications at a lower level, that's level, um, not lever, were material considerations. Thank you. So, other members. Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, so, this isn't a correction to the minutes. It's uh, a point of additional information. I'm kind of looking at Rory, if that's a thing. Uh, so, it pertains to page 12, the top paragraph in page 12, which was a recording of a response that I gave to a question from Heather Williams about um, a, a, a proposed, well, kind of proposed development from uh, a company called Fakenham. It's written as Fakenham here, which I think will uh, alarm the residents of uh, Fakenham. So, uh, so I just, if I could just give some additional information, 
um, and it, that relates to an email. So this, this question was asked on the 23rd of September 2021. Um, I refer back to an email I sent to Councillor Williams on the 17th of December 2020, um, which said uh, a similar question about emails between this company and myself. It says, having checked back on my emails, I had a request for a meeting with Thacom from their PR company, Kratos, on the 7th of the 7th, 20. They then wrote again on the 13th of the 7th and on the 21st of the 7th. On offers of advice, I declined their invitations on the grounds that I could not discuss any sites that might be in the local plan call for sites. Early in September, I received a call from Kratos, uh, who were their promotional company, to say a press release was coming out the next week about something I knew nothing about, and that this might cause embarrassment if the council was not aware of it. Uh, uh, Liz Watt spoke to Craters on the 14th and the 9th, confirmed that the meeting was, I quote, not about any site in the call for sites. Um, I therefore agreed to a 45-minute meeting with Stephen Kelly present. Uh, this meeting took place on the 25th and the 9th. During this meeting, both Stephen Kelly and I told Thacom if they had any plans, they had to go through the proper process, which was the call for sites. Um, a second short meeting involving myself and uh, Stephen Kelly took place on the 7th of the 12th in response to Thaker, with Kratos, in response to Thaker informing the council that they were going live with a press release the following day because we felt we needed to know what was going to be in it. I hope that satisfies. Thank you very much. Uh, and we had uh, hands up from Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. On page six, on the second line, the third paragraph, there's an extra that. Um, on page seven... <coughs> uh, Sorry, just to clarify, Councillor, <coughs> which paragraph was it, page six? Page six, second line of the third paragraph. That, that, yes? Okay, thank you. On page seven, at the end of the fifth paragraph... It says, um, agreed by all councillors. That's not what I, I said. I said, agreed by this administration. And, and actually, we can't say all councillors because Councillor Howell actually voted against it. Um, page 10, and this goes on throughout, and the point that the leaders made that FACOM, it's TH rather than F, so it's not as if in the place in Norfolk. Um, and then just a, a point of additional information on page 7, the 90% figure... Um, was later found to be incorrect as it didn't include one of the vacant properties. Sorry, which was that? Page 7, did you page say? Page 7. The 90% figure where? Um, on page 7. Where on page 7? On moment, Chair. I can't see anything as of an, a percentage. Ah, okay, so yeah. we're middle fourth of the paragraph, fourth paragraph. Um, It later transpired that that um, omitted one of the um, properties which is currently vacant so that's just a point of extra information okay thank you very much councillor daunter thank you yes thank you um page six um towards the top of the page um the paragraph beginning councillor dr claire daunton um i think the sentence should read she explained that the original draft code of conduct had been examined by herself and former councillor dr douglas de Lacey, as Chair and Vice-Chair of Civic Affairs. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Clayton? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, actually a point that, of, of a minute that, that's not, that I cannot find, which was a, a, a comment that I made about the medium-term financial strategy in that there was no mention of a cultural strategy development. Um, which I, Do you remember no. where in the in the minutes it would have fitted? <sighs> I, at what at what subject? I can't, I'm afraid. Or, or, what I recall is that Councillor, the leader, Councillor Bridget Smith, was was very supportive of the idea that a cultural strategy should be included in the in the um, budget and business planning, and that the thing, that's what that's what's led to a whole range of meetings around it, because otherwise. You know, later on in the agenda, the Labour proposal just seems to come out of nowhere. Okay, um, we can try and find that um, space, perhaps um, maybe by uh, outside the meeting. Um, I do remember you talking about the cultural capital. Thank you. Okay, um, so with those amendments, uh, members, are you happy to approve the minutes of 23rd of September 2021 as amended? 
and with those adjustments as a correct record by affirmation. Agreed? Thank you. So, uh, on to the minutes of the 18th of October. Uh, are members happy to approve the minutes of the meeting of the 18th of October? I have no amendments. Does anybody else have, have any? No? Can't see any. So, members, are you happy to take those minutes as approved and a correct record um, by affirmation? Agreed. Oh, pause a moment. Sorry, Councillor um, Ellington. Um, thank you. Um, I was promised a written response for, to my question um, about um, uh, the number of administrators um, on page 22 responsible for the uh, accounts, and I haven't received that. But are the minutes correct, Councillor Ellington, as far as you're concerned? The minute is correct, okay. the action is not completed. Okay, that's fine. So perhaps we can take that away and get a quote and answer to you. Um, sorry, I thought you had indicated to speak, Councillor Williams. No. No. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Right, okay then. Uh, so, minutes approved then. So, under announcements, um, I'd like to make the following announcement, and that is, if members would like to donate to the Chair's Charity, Centre 33, please do get the contact details and payment details from Glenda Hansen. Uh, Leader, do you wish to make any announcements? Uh, not today, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Chief Executive Officer, do you have any um, announcements? No. Okay. Thank you very much. So, moving on. Item six, questions from the public then. We have received two public questions from James Littlewood and Ben Shelton. The questions have been circulated with the main agenda and, sorry, and in a supplement published on the 18th of February. I understand Mr. Shelton, sorry, Mr. Littlewood has confirmed he will attend remotely. Uh, and I'm not quite sure whether Mr. Shelton is also going to attend remotely or in the room. He's at the back of the room. Okay, lovely, thank you. So first, firstly, uh, Mr. Little, would you, like, would you like to put your camera on if you're able to do so? And um, I, I'm going to invite you to ask your question, but in view of the length of your question and that it has been published in the agenda, I was wondering whether it's possible for you to summarize uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll do my best uh, to do that. Uh, firstly, just say, although I'm Chief Executive of Cambridge Past, Present and Future, I'm making this request on behalf of uh, a group called Better Ways and Busways, which is an umbrella group for parish councils, NGOs and others who believe there's a better viable alternative to the GCP scheme being proposed for the south east of Cambridge. Um, so, in summary, the July, in July, the GCP Executive Board gave approval for the Cambridge South East Busway Scheme to be submitted to the Department for Transport. It hasn't yet been submitted, and since then, there have been some significant changes in relation to this scheme. Firstly, as you might be aware, that the preferred option for the next local plan is to include an extension of the Cambridge Biomedical Campus next to the A1307. Now, this new extension wouldn't be served by the GCP's proposed busway, but it could be served by a route which was considered by the GCP in 2018, but um, discounted. Secondly, we reviewed the decision that was made by the GCP in 2018 to discount a route, discount a route in the A1307 corridor in favour of a route through open countryside. And it's clear that one of the major deciding factors was that the A1307 corridor options could not form part of the Cambridgeshire Autonomous Metro, known as the CAM. As you're very well aware, following the mayoral election, the CAM has now been dropped, and so there's no longer a policy requirement for fully segregated routes. So given that that was a major factor in reaching this decision, uh, we feel that there's a need to review that decision in light of that change. And it's also wanted to note that the local transport plan is no longer being refreshed and will in fact be a more significant review, which won't be completed until the autumn. Thirdly, as you might also be aware, a planning inspector has recently granted permission for a new development on the edge of Stapleford. And this includes the creation of a new country park and the busway would run through or adjacent to that country park. 
So the impact of the busway will now have to be assessed in terms of its impact on that park rather than on the private agricultural land. In other words, the negative impact of the busway has increased. Fourthly, plans for Cambridge House Station have progressed uh, and permission for that will be granted well ahead of the busway. Uh, that means a network rail scheme will be on site before the busway. Uh, they intend to use some of the same uh, works compounds as the GCP scheme, which we believe will create a risk of further delay for the GCP scheme. And finally, there's a growing awareness of the carbon emissions that are created by large infrastructure projects such as the busway. And the alternative options require less infrastructure and therefore will have better carbon budget. And as a council, you'll be aware that you've pledged to reduce emissions as fast as possible. So we've carried out some preliminary work to consider an alternative busway within the A1307 corridor. This would involve adding sections of bus lane to the road to avoid congestion. There would still be a large park and ride at Babraham, um, and but it, the, the new busway that we're proposing would, would effectively cut across countryside where the extension of the biomedical campus would be. So it would serve the new expansion of the biomedical campus and also bypass traffic in that location. So this alternative would provide a similar journey times and reliability as the proposed off-road busway put forward by the GCP, but it could be delivered at significantly less cost, more quickly and with less damage to the countryside. And due to the expansion plans of the biomedical campus, it would also deliver higher economic and transport benefits. So we're requesting that the council uses its position on the GCP executive board to ask the GCP to formally revisit the decisions that it made in 2018 and 2021, and also ask the GCP to carry out a full assessment of an optimal scheme in the A1307 corridor as a viable alternative. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Littlewood. Uh, and I understand Councillor Goff, uh, who's attending remotely, will respond to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you for your question, uh, Mr Littlewood. So, um, major infrastructure projects um, like uh, CSET are complex. They affect many people over a wide geographic area. And for that reason, there is a process of evaluation that has been prescribed by the Department of Transport. And that process cannot be circumvented. But one of the consequences of that is that the process takes time. And during that period, there will inevitably be change in circumstances and proposals made that may or may not come to pass. The CSET scheme reflects the ambitions of the transport strategy for Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire, prepared in parallel with the extant local plan. Delivery of such infrastructure is therefore essential to support planned new homes and jobs. As required by the Department of Transport's transport scheme guidance, the GCP board considered a number of factors when agreeing the preferred strategy for progressing CSET. This included the results of public consultation, the ability to serve local set settlements such as Great Shelford, Stapleford and Sawston, and the wider economic benefits of the scheme man reflecting the mandate of the city deal. All things will be considered and incorporated as the project proceeds and refinements made. But what is not possible is that whenever there is a change or the prospect of change, we all go back and restart the process. That approach would be a recipe for an action in addressing the needs of improved infrastructure in this corridor, which I fervently believe is common ground between us. Officers from the GCP will continue to keep under review changes in circumstances to determine whether the original basis under which they recommend to the board the CSET scheme uh, needs to change. Their advice to date is not withstanding the matters you have identified. The assessment process upon which the board made its decisions is still sound. And the board will continue to seek their advice on the provenance of that solution offered. And as a board member, I am satisfied with their advice and guidance to date. The GCP proposed Transport and Works Act or application will provide for a full public inquiry into the CSET proposals presided over by an independent inspector. The inspector will hear both from the applicant, which is the GCP, and objectors to the scheme, ensuring effective public scrutiny of the scheme. All of these issues will be considered as part of that process. It is therefore in everyone's interest that a full public inquiry is undertaken, allowing groups such as Better Ways Than Busways 
and others the opportunity to put forward their views, including any revised proposals, thereby providing reassurance to the communities of Gate of Cambridge of an open and transparent decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. Uh, Mr Littlewood, do you have a supplementary question? This is one minute. Uh, yes, Councillor Goff mentioned there that the, uh, the DFT guidance actually does require back checking in a process. So when there is a significant change to a project, there is a requirement for the decision to be revisited. He seems to be indicating that that has taken place, but I'm not aware that the officer's advice or any information is in the public domain in re with that respect. And will he uh, offer to promise that that advice is made available so that we can be sure the back checking has taken place? Councillor Goff. Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Littlewood. Yes, I, you know, I can assure you that the process, as you correctly say, will be followed. And to the extent we can make any of that information available, we, we will do so on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Um, uh, Littlewood. 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 Sorry, I do apologise. Thank you. Littlewood, it's there in front of me. Moving on then uh, to Mr. Ben Shelton. Mr. Shelton, would you like to ask your question? Well, thank you, Chair. The technology has improved somewhat over the recent years. Um, my question is regarding water in Shelford and Stapleford, and I think members will have a copy of the question that I submitted, uh, which is on, that on the 8th of February this year, residents in Stapleford and Shelford found out through the media that the water supply to households may have been dangerous, which naturally caused some panic and concern. So my question is to the administration, when was, did you know that there was a potential problem with the water supply affecting those areas? Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Uh, Councillor Brian Milnes is going to respond. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the question. Um, so South Cambridgeshire District Council first became aware of the claims around PFAS and the specific PFOS. Uh, when contacted by a freelance journalist on Wednesday, the 2nd of February. We immediately sought to gain, gain clarity on this claim uh, from Cambridge Water, who were the responsible body, while also sp seeking guidance from the Drinking Water Inspectorate and the UK Health Security Agency and the Environment Agency in order to assess the information in this emerging area. Replies, of course, were not instant, and there is little official uh, guidance on this topic available online. So our aim was to gather facts to allow a proportionate and helpful response, rather than simply responding with an immediate public statement, which may not have pro provided clarity or reassurance for residents. Via email on Thursday the 3rd, we received advice from Cambridge Water that the affected borehole had been taken out of service in June last year and that there was no continuing risk to customers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milnes. Mr Shelton, we have see, seen a, a text of a supplementary question. Would you like to put your supplementary? Uh, thank you, Chair, and yes, and I appreciate uh, Councillor Mill's response um, on that. The, 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 the question um, is for, for Cambridge Water, while they're saying it is safe now, many residents were asking, was it safe prior to June 2021? But my supplementary um, is regarding uh, any meetings and dialogue that the authority have had with uh, Cambridge Water and what this authority is doing to communicate that with residents of Shelford and Stapleford. Thank you very much, Mr. Shelton. Councillor Milnes, would you like to respond to the supplementary? Yes, so 
as we indicated, we had um, several lines of communication open on this issue, including with Cambridge Water. And as soon as we were made aware on the 2nd of February, uh, numerous emails, meetings and conversations um, have arisen between Cambridge Water and ourselves, Cambridge Water being the responsible authority for uh, drinking water through the tap. Uh, the first meeting uh, that we had was on the 4th of February and the subsequent meetings held on the 10th of February. Uh, local district councillors and myself attended a specially convened public meeting of Great Shelford Parish Council on the 9th of February, at which Cambridge Water attended in order to allay residents' concerns about the water supply they provide. We can also confirm that other multi-agency meetings with the UK Health Security Agency and the County Public Health uh, Department have also taken place. While still working to gather information about the claims, the Council began working to support residents whose water is provided by private water supply, uh, such as boreholes and wells, in the area around Duxford. While water authorities are responsible for mains water supply, so Cambridge Water in this case, the council has responsibility for monitoring this small number of private water supplies. Environmental health officers visited homes with these private water supplies in the area around Duxford on Wednesday the 9th, Thursday the 10th, and Monday the 14th of February to both discuss the situation with affected residents in person and to conduct sampling of water supplies. When the story was published on Tuesday the 8th, the lead member, myself, was actively involved in dealing with the concerns uh, expressed and forwarding Cambridge Water's response to residents in the area. On the afternoon of Friday the 18th of February, so last Friday, we received the first of uh, 16 of Lynn 20. Mills, you need to point up, please. Yep, uh, not got long to go. Sampling, uh, 16 out of 20 sampling results, uh, which have been confirmed verbally, the four remaining ones uh, just yesterday, uh, so that we can assure uh, local residents that their water supplies are safe for consumption. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Right. Um, Thank you very much indeed, members. And I'm going to go to, uh, I believe, Councillor Batchelor would like to make a declaration of interest. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I should have done this earlier in the meeting, um, but I need to declare that I'm an unpaid member of the Council's two investment partnership boards, which are mentioned at various points throughout the agenda, main, namely under item eight. Thank you very much, Councillor Batchelor. Uh, moving on in the agenda to item seven, petitions, um, uh, sorry, I, I meant to say to Mr. Shelton before he left, thank you for attending. <laughs> um, there are no petitions that have been received for consideration at this meeting, so we'll move on to uh, the following recommendations. The first of which is item 8A, the pay policy statement for 2022, which is a recommendation of the Employment and Staffing Committee on the 14th of January 22. And it is on pages 25 to 38 of our agenda. May I call upon Councillor John Williams, the lead cabinet member for finance, to move the recommendation of, employment, of the Employment and Staffing Committee as stated in the papers. Councillor Williams. We can't hear you, Councillor Williams. You need to put your microphone on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, my first report to you, I hope, will not be contentious. I'm pleased to present the revised pay policy statement and recommend it for approval. As the report describes our current pay gap ratio between the highest and lowest pay points, and that between the salary of the chief executive and the lowest paid employee, continues to be under one to eight, which, compared, uh, which compares very favorably with other organizations. The gender balance of the highest grades continues to be in favor of female staff, and, the, and overall, the mean gender pay gap between the mean hourly rate of male full pay equivalent employees and that of female full pay equivalent employees is 9.54% 9 9 
in favour of females, and the mean median rate is minus 19.48% in favour of females. This applies across the board with the exception of the shared waste service where the council's workforce is mainly male. Although we, we are encouraging women to join our waste service, we do, of course, have a policy of a minimum £10 wage for council employees, which um, has, is reflected in this. Finally, I feel I ought to bring your attention to our contribution to the local government pension scheme, which, as you can see, is currently 17%. That is, the council contributes 17% of pensionable pay to the pension of a member of staff within the pension scheme. Also, we will be seeing our national insurance contribution increase in April in line with government policy. This means that when we employ someone, nearly a third of the cost of that employment will be going to either the pension scheme or the government in the national insurance contribution. And that is a real disincentive for us to employ people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Do you have a seconder for that? Recommendation. I believe Councillor Henry Batchelor. Yes, Thank please, you. Chair. I'll speak at the end if needed. Thank you. Thank you. So you're reserving your rights. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're open for debate then, members. Would, is it Councillor Ellington and, sorry, uh, in Councillor order, Williams. Councillor Williams first, Councillor Heather Williams first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say that I sit on Staff Employment Committee as well, and we, and we did welcome the report for the um, pay gaps. We did also say that um, going forward, we should look at things on the basis of perhaps taking out bottom and top so that some, some sort of, obviously, we have female chief exec, um, for example, so that we are making sure we get um, a view across the board. So going forward, um, hopefully that will be taken on board the what was mentioned at committee. Um, but, um, but yes, very, very welcome report, Chair. Thank you very much. And Councillor Ellington. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been here nearly 16 years, and perhaps I haven't read the papers before as well as I have this time. But I, I just wanted to be sure I wasn't reading something that was inaccurate. Um, I note on page 34, the returning officer gets £372.72p for each ward, which seems an enormous amount if you count those 45 wards um, in our um, council, and therefore there is potential for uh, a very substantial, I mean, I added it up to £45,000, and thought, gosh, does that really happen every year? And I, I just want clarity, really. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. Um, Councillor Williams? Thank you, Chair. Well, first of all, it happens when we have elections. So um, it happens when we have a district council election, which is every four years, and when there's a general election. Uh, and and therefore um, it's not every year. Secondly, um, I understand that this is set for us. Um, so uh, we don't really, um, uh, the Chief Exec may want to respond here, but I, that's my understanding that the, this, this, is, this rate is set for us. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, I think Liz Watts would like to speak. If I may, Chair. So uh, I understand that it's a rate that's agreed across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and that it has been in place for some time. I can tell you now it's certainly not £45,000 um, that the returning officer has paid for a district council election, but I don't have the, I haven't done one uh, in my time here and I don't have the number off the top of my head. Thank you. Right, members. So, um, Councillor Batchelor, would you like to... I can't see any other hands up, so Councillor Batchelor, would you like to say? Thank you. Not much more to say, Chair. It seems there seems to be general agreement on this, um, albeit just to say, obviously, happy as Chair of the Employment Committee to take on board any comments around the way we do look at this in the future and coming years. So happy to do that and happy to uh, put this to Council, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, members, can I 
check that you are happy to take this by affirmation. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody wishing to vote against or to abstain? I can't see. I can't see anybody. Is anybody online? Thank you. So, in that case, members of the council therefore agrees this motion by affirmation. Thank you very much. Um, I had some indication that another member might wish to declare an interest. Does anybody wish to declare any further interests? Sorry, Chair, if I just might come in at this stage. Obviously, Councillor Fian is not in the uh, meeting um, present physically, but um, it, it might be um, that he would like to declare an interest as a director of um, South Cam's Limited Trading as Urban Street, but it's a matter for himself. Councillor Fain, did you wish to declare such an interest? It's yeah, obviously, if advised uh, by uh, monitoring officer, certainly declared interest as director of both Shire Homes and Ermin Street Housing to the extent that is relevant to this particular agenda. It is on my list of declared interests. Thank you very much, Councillor Fain. Okay, moving on to item 8B. This is the Council's business plan for 2020 to 2025, which went to Cabinet on the 7th of February 2022 and is in our agenda at pages 39 to 62. May I call on the leader to propose the recommendation of Cabinet? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, it's a, uh, it's a very uh, comprehensive document. I hope you've all read it. It um, very helpfully summarises all the achievements of this Council uh, over, the, uh, over the past uh, four years, uh, and also sets out very clearly ambitious plans to build on the work that has been going on in the last four years as we move forward uh, for future years. So I don't think I need to go through the detail of it because I think it's extremely clearly set out there, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And do you have a seconder? I believe that's yes, Councillor Mills. Second Thank you. Do you wish to speak now or to reserve your right? I'll speak at the end if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're open for debate. Um, I believe Councillor Neil Goff would like to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this uh, business plan covers the five-year period to 2025 and maintains the focus on our four key priorities of helping businesses to grow, building homes that are affordable to live in, being green to our core, and putting customers at the centre of everything we do. As a result of the pandemic, we recognise the need to add additional focus on supporting businesses in our area and increasing the resilience of our communities. We recognize this through the creation of two new cabinet positions and the enhanced focus on these areas continues in this plan. In some ways, the most important element of this plan are the achievements at the bottom of each section. The fact that so much has been achieved, particularly over the past two years, is testament, testament to the flexibility, skill and determination of our officers. We thank them for that. And all of this has been achieved above and beyond the day-to-day -day services that we've continued to deliver efficiently and effectively. The delivery has been impressive from the practical support given to businesses in the pandemic to the delivery of, two, of, of new council homes at a rate of roughly one a week. In the interest of time, I will not detail them one by one, but many represent significant achievements in the way we are delivering for our customers. The next phase of the plan is further progress on these objectives, further support for local businesses, further support to communities through the, through the successful liaison group meetings, for example, creating a work program for insulation me measures on our council house stock, progressing the community facilities at North Stowe, progressing our zero carbon strategy with another round of zero carbon grants and implementing our double nature, doubling nature strategy further progress in improving the accessibility and convenience of our services to residents and businesses. All very exciting initiatives, all underpinned by a sound financial strategy and budget, without which we would not be able to deliver and execute such an ambitious plan. I fully support this plan and recommend it to the Council. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fain, do you wish to 
Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. Does anybody else wish to speak? Thank you. Um, I would just like to observe that on page 57, there's a, a name of doc missing in the document, um, which I'm sure will be filled in at a later point. Uh, it's in the bullets at the bottom of the page. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, do go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And um, I did pull out about page 57. Um, so if, if perhaps before the vote's taken, someone could let us know what that document refers to, that would be, that would be good. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that this may sound um, holistic, but I think a lot of the time what brings us all here is much more, we're much more in agreement than, than not. Um, but there will inevitably be times of disagreement. Um, so there is things in here that I welcome, um, and as a group, we've always tried to support things that benefit the environment and, and help move things forward as we try to achieve zero carbon. However, there are things in here that I'm, I'm not content with, particularly around the financial implications of the investment strategy. On, and it does seem to be very reliant on that in the business plan. Page 48, at A5, and page 59, two different elements relying on the same thing to deliver. And that makes it potentially unsustainable, in, in my view. So I won't be supporting it on, on, those, on those bases. But there is something more fundamental that I do struggle with, and I, I think I raised this in, in the first budget meeting that I attended, when I said it was originally clients, now it's customers. Chair, we do not have customers. We serve residents. And I say that because if you're a customer of a shop or, you know, we've all brand loyal, you have a right and an ability to move and change your commercial preference. That's what customers have. They have the right to spend the money where and how they wish. But our residents do not. They cannot go to a different council and ask them to collect their bins. They can't ask a different council to, you know, submit their planning application without actually physically moving. So I would stress again, the emphasis should be on serving residents and not the commercialisation of customers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before... Um Councillor Heather Williams, would you like to just clarify where it was you said that there were two things relying on one piece of information? Just so that members can um, okay, Page understand. 48, Chair. 58. A5, continue to deliver on our investment strategy. And page 59, generate income through delivery Did councils. you say 48 or 58? 48, 48, 48 and 59. 48 and 59. Do, do we know what it is? You've got it. Okay, good. Fine. As long as somebody's made a note, that's fine. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? Yes. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Chair. Um, as is my want, I just wanted to flag up a couple of things which seem to have been kind of lost over over the, the four years that I've been talking about and with with yourselves as the controlling party. Uh, and the first one is that the I've. And I want to applaud the, the, the Encompass training that's happened uh, and the training around Gypsy Roma and Traveller uh, cultures. Um, and so I want to start with that. that I'm, re I'm really pleased to see that work going on. Um, but the, it doesn't seem to be woven into this document. And that's, that's where I'm kind of slightly concerned, that, um, particularly around the Visit South Cambridgeshire brand. You know, there was talk at the earlier stage of that, uh, which never came to anything that we were going to pick up on the Encompass training and the Safer Spaces uh, kite mark for local businesses and encourage local businesses to adopt those marks so that LGBTQ members of uh, customers, if you want to call them customers, uh, also feel um, that, that, that that very direct and, and public message is being, is being sent. I think that needs to be picked up again. Um, I can't, as, a, as the history of Camborne High Street, I can't fail but just flag up, you know, I'm wondering where that, where that fits in terms of uh, encouraging uh, local shops and high street developments. Um, and also uh, on page nine, um, 
again, fo focusing on health and well-being of our communities, and again, that feeds through into a cultural strategy, which I, I'm, I'm guessing is, is maybe not going to be considered today uh, as a budget proposal, um, and maybe won't have a budget line identified for it. Um, but that's, that's a really important thing that needs to be picked up in these, in these ambitions uh, that you're expressing here. And also just wondering where the benefits maximization officer, whether that is picked up on page 52 within the, the support, which I also welcome, and, and particularly on the back of the, the appointment of that post, the support that's been given to um, uh, people in receipt of benefits and for vulnerable tenants. And I'm just a little confused whether that is the benefits maximization income officer role or whether it's some other role. So I, I think that's worth uh, flagging up if it, I can't see it here. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and just finally, on the green to our core section, I mean, Brian, who I've enjoyed sitting next to for, well, apart from the pandemic, most of the four years that I've been a councillor, um, I, I've asked you and, and Pippa about you know, where does the plastic waste go that is, that is collected? And you've get, done your best to answer that question, I know, but I'm still not clear on how much of that plastic waste that is collected in South Cambridgeshire is recycled in the UK and not shipped Councillor Clayton, I remind you to address your question to the chair. Thank I'm you. sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Had you finished? Yes. Thank you, okay. So, um, yes, Councillor Mills, would you like to respond? Or you, you're, you're seconding, so I'm just wondering would you like to respond to that? Is everybody else finished? I think yeah. so. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think I need to uh, point out logical fallacies in the Leader of the Sorry, Opposition. Uh, we can't hear you very well. Do you want to bring your microphone a little closer? Oh, I'll, I'll just lean forward a little bit. Is that better? Slightly. Not, not great. It's not very easy to hear you. Okay. That's better. How's that? That's better. Thank you. Good. Okay, I was just expressing anything. the re reluctance to point out logical fallacies from the opposition's statement because um, our customers or our residents do, do have a choice and they'll be able to exercise that choice on May the 5th. Uh, but otherwise, I would like to uh, give my support to this motion. Thank you. Point of personal explanation, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Mills. Point of explanation, would you like? Um, so, so, yes. So, I feel the lead member for environmental services may have misunderstood me. I'm saying that our residents, unless they move to a different district, will have the council, regardless of what administration is in place. It is this council, and therefore we serve as a council the residents, regardless of who is in opposition or who is in administration. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Thank you. So, so um, I understand that there, uh, some of you may not wish to support this. So uh, I propose to take a vote on this. Members, uh, we, uh, would you like to proceed to a vote? Thank you. So do we have the wherewithal to go to a vote, folks? So members, uh, for those of you who are quick off the mark, you've already understood what to do. So first of all, press the blue button to indicate that you're here. If you're in, in support of the motion, press green. And if you oppose the motion, press red. So press the blue button first. Is everybody OK and understanding what they're doing? Has everybody voted? Yeah. Councillor Bygott looks as if he's having problems. Are you okay? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So, so that vote is carried uh, on the basis of. I just thought, sorry. Can we just check that everybody has in the room voted? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. And the results are 19 in favour and nine against, one abstention. Okay, so that is carried. Thank you. Councillor Bygott, if you want to escape, that's fine. Are you coming back, Councillor Bygott? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Item 8C then, and Councillor Bygott will not be able to vote on this if he doesn't get back uh, pretty shortly. Localised council tax support members. This is from 2022 to 2023. Uh, recommended to Cabinet on the 7th of February, or it's a recommendation from Cabinet on the 7th of February. And it's on pages 63 to 66 in our agendas. So, Councillor John Williams, would you like to present the um, recommendation? Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope, members, this is another non-contentious report from me. Uh, for the introduction of universal credit, we totally changed the way in which we apply localised council tax support by using income bands. This gave claimants some stability should their circumstances be constantly changing and avoided additional cost to the administration for the scheme and with further automation of the process, we anticipate further savings in the future. It is our intention to review the scheme early in the new financial year to ensure it takes account of the emerging financial implications of COVID-19 on our residents. The scheme has proved to be very successful and I recommend to you that you approve the continuation of the scheme meanwhile, but uprate it by 3.1% to ensure that those residents in receipt of benefits and limited means will not be worse off due to inflation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Do you have a seconder? Yes. Councillor no. John Batchelor, thank you. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right? I reserve my right. Thank you very much, Councillor Batchelor. Okay, so would anybody wish to speak? Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. I, I won't rerun everything that I said at Cabinet, but um, I did say that this, this particular document um, has a, a close place in my heart, and I think it was meant for continuity and to give certainty. So I'm pleased that there isn't any proposed changes. We'll support it. So, um, And also to just, just prove to all members that Councillor John Williams and myself, we can agree on occasion, where they may be. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. So... Um, no further requests to speak. So, are members happy to vote for this by affirmation? Agreed. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just one moment. Sorry, I do apologise. Councillor Bachelor, I do apologise. You're second. No, I'm, I'm willing to quit whilst we're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to speak? No, no. Well, I'm very happy with that. Let's do it. Great. Okay, then. Thank you very much indeed. So, I apologise. I didn't mean to curtail your uh, you speaking. So, um, are members happy to take that by affirmation, then? Thank you. Okay. And anyone wishing to object or abstain? And I note that Councillor Bygott wasn't in the room for that vote, uh, but has now returned. This is purely for the purposes of the minutes, not, not to show you up, Councillor Bygott. Okay, item 8D then. Uh, so that's taken by affirmation. Thank you, thank you very much, members. Moving on to item 8D. The capital programme, sorry, the capital programme for 2022-23 to 2026-27, which is a recommendation of Cabinet on the 7th of February, and is on pages 67 to 78 of our agenda. Uh, may I call upon Councillor John Williams to uh, propose the motion? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my next report brings you a revised capital programme for the next five years to the financial year 2026-27 for you to approve. This revision takes account of the changes made to the Public Works Loan Board rules, which now precludes us from investing purely for financial gain you will see that we must adhere to a number of prudential indicators to ensure the programme is affordable 
And with regard to this, I'm proposing that we only agree to a level of capital investment that is affordable on the, in the long term, which is revised, which this revised program does. The revised schemes, including those that have required reprofiling, are listed in paragraph 11 of the report. The total external borrowing required for this five-year program, including our current borrowing, remains within our borrowing limits as described in our capital strategy. As you can see, for the coming financial year, we intend to spend nearly £50 million on capital projects. These include over £6 million in total on solar energy, electricity for our water beach depot, more electric refuge, collection vehicles and mechanical road sweepers, £100,000 on land drainage, £145,000 on LED street lights, and £110,000 on additional e electric vehicle charging points. For North Stow, there is over £8 million for the Civic Hub, Sports Pavilion and Community Centre, with a further £10 million earmarked for 2023-24, and nearly a £1 million for home improvement grants and loans every year for, for the five years. So please approve this green and community-based capital programme. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, do you have a seconder? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, I'd like to second that. Thank you, Councillor Peter MacDonald. Uh, would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Uh, reserve my right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, this is open for debate. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Sorry. So, on page 69, paragraph 14, it says the level of borrowing is a factor that needs to be considered by the Council as increasing borrowing will lead to increased revenue costs associated with the financing of borrowing and as such would fall on Council tax. On page 71, we can see the amount of borrowing intended on the chart on paragraph 27. But when we look at page 75, we can see the investment strategy requirement. And on page 78, we can see the external borrowing requirement, which, which mirrors like for like. I would stress that this external borrowing is needed to fulfill the commercialization projects and the investment strategy. At this current time, that level of borrowing a, I believe, is at a rate that is unsustainable long term. But B, in the current climate and the uncertainty that many are facing and markets are facing, I really do not think that that is a wise thing for this council to be doing at this time. We, we are not, or I am not, opposed to maximising our assets. And things like Ermine Street has always had our full support and, in fact, was set up by us and has returned very well for this council. So I'm not saying that, you know, these projects and investments don't work or shouldn't be done. But I do think we ought to be extremely careful that when we're getting into debt to do them. And that is my main reason for not supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Ruth Betson. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is in relation to page 77. Um, Members' laptops, £50,000. Um, I was just wondering, what, how has that been offered? Um, I think a few of us weren't aware that uh, it was an option. Uh, or uh, How has that been communicated? Or Councillor Williams, would you like to respond? It's page 77. And it's about six lines down. It's members' laptops under head of transformation, HR, and corporate services. About this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so Councillor Williams, Liz Watts has said she would respond, the Chief Executive Officer. Thank you. If you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, as you know, we do have a district election coming up. And we're proposing to offer laptops to all members following May. Um, we're actually going to do a survey of members very shortly in the next week or so to try and assess what sort, you know, what, what sort of laptops would be useful and how to use them and so on, so that when the election happens, we've got everything ready to go. 
Thank you, uh, Ms. Watts. Councillor Williams, Councillor Heather Williams. Do come Thank back. you, Chair. Just, just on that response, can I clarify, because it's in the revised budget for this year. Um, May, obviously, will be in the 2023 20, year. So is it in the wrong column, or are we proposing to purchase them ahead of the election? Just to clarify, please. For you, Chair, we're proposing to purchase them this year to have them ready for May. Thank you. Councillor Williams, Councillor John Williams. Yes, Sorry. thank you, Chair. Can I explain that the reason we are giving laptops to members is so that they can participate in council anywhere? At the moment, using our own laptops, we can't fully participate in council anywhere. We need um, laptops that are, have got the right software on so that we can do that. So that is why we've got this amount of money in the budget. It will be spent this year in readiness for the start of the new financial year uh, after the elections in May. Thank you very much. And as the user of a South Council District Council laptop in dire need of update, I'm very pleased to see this money in the budget. Councillor Bygott, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So further to that same question, what would happen if a lot of councillors uh, decided not to have the new laptops after they had already been bought? Is there a risk that we would have things in stock that we wouldn't be able to use? Thank you. Uh, would uh, uh, just one moment. Would Ms. Watts like to respond? Through you, Chair. Mm -hmm. So, three uh, CICT provides an IT service to over a thousand colleagues across three councils. So we have a constant churn of stock going through. So it would be absolutely no problem. If, I mean, that stock could easily be reallocated to officers. Thank you. Councillor Clayton, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to pick up on the, um, the ability to fully engage with council business through a laptop. As we'll see later, people can't second proposals, budget proposals and the like, or vote. Um, so I, I question whether that's, that's actually going to solve that problem unless there's a policy change within council about how people can engage remotely. Ms. Watts, would you like to respond? If you'd like me to, Chair, just to clarify. Uh, if, uh, that, so the reason people can't vote um, is because national legislation. Um, but I think what Councillor Williams was referring to was that, um, uh, that the laptops that officers are using are on a platform where we have a huge number of apps that make it a lot more easy for us to communicate with each other through means other than by email. And um, I think that's the service that we're trying to offer to councillors so that as we continue rolling out the hybrid working, it, you don't feel as though you need to be face to face with somebody in the office. You're able to be face to face as you would be in a Teams meeting, but through a much easier platform. Thank you, Ms. Watts. And Councillor Bill Handley. Thank you. Um, just like to uh, say that I'm really pleased to see, as I'm sure the people of Norstow will be, the residents of Norstow will be, to see um, the money appearing now in the budget for the uh, Norstow uh, Civic Hub, Sports Pavilion, and so on. It's very welcome. Uh, seeing the money in the budget makes it feel a bit real. Thank you very much, Councillor Handy. Uh, with if there are any, yeah, oh, Councillor Smith, yes. Thank you. Just uh, picking up on the um, so previous comment, uh, it is a frustration to us that we can't access pink papers, um, you know, by using our own our own laptops, um, and there's no choice but print them out and post them to us or hand deliver them to us, and we are trying very very hard <laughs> to be paperless, um, but you know it will it will help us help us move to that. And uh, yes, it is a it is a frustration which I hope uh, this will this will go some way to resolving. Thank you very much, members. So coming back to the second, uh, Councillor Peter MacDonald, would you like to respond? Um, uh, Councillor Handley stole my thunder uh, <laughs> because I was going to say how welcome it was to see the programme for North Stow, so thank you to him. Okay, so then, members, I don't hear anybody in disagreement with this, so can I ask... Oh, man. oh you wanted a vote, sorry, okay. In which case, we'll go to a vote. Chairman, sorry, oh, it's Deborah. Councillor Roberts, yes, yeah, sorry. Did Sorry to speak before we go to a vote. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I didn't put my hand up or in the chat room or whatever. 
I, I would just say that I, I share the anxieties of Heather Williams, Councillor Heather Williams, um, at a time of such uncertainty, not only locally, uh, but nationally and in the world. I really think that we need to be very careful um, about um, borrowing money uh, and how much we borrow. And I'm a little uh, conscious that we are borrowing a lot of money. Um, and as for the laptop situation, well, this is a second hand one, uh, which has been, thank you very much, uh, given to me during the time of the um, pandemic. And I found it very useful. Um, but I have to say, I'm really, I really think that before uh, any move was taken, you actually ought to have spoken. Um, I can't recall anybody coming to me and saying, do you need uh, a brand new one? Um, we do like, seem to like to spend other, mon other people's money. We do forget it's not our money, it's our taxpayers' money. And, you know, should we really be spending £50,000 at this particular moment in time? I think we've got a lot better things to be spending it on than ourselves. Um, and it disappoints me. Um, it's just like the, the building itself and all the tarting up, which I personally think was greatly unnecessary, at most of it. And when you look at all the done-up loos and the done-up cafe areas and the done-up members, you know, what uh, impression does that give to the public? It doesn't make us a better council. It's just making ourselves more comfortable. I don't think it's acceptable. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. OK, since the seconder has already spoken, I'm going to uh, take us to a vote then, members. Uh, so would I just wait for the vote to be put on our micro mic microphones. So press the blue button to register that you're here and press the green button if you agree, the red button if you disagree with the recommendation. Has, there are two people who appear not to have voted. One. Is anybody having a struggle? Is Councillor Bhattacharya having a problem with voting? Okay, we're all there. So that's 20 in favour, nine opposing. That vote is carried. Sorry, the recommendation is carried. Okay, so moving on to I. Right, just um, thank you. Right, 8E is the Treasury Management Strategy, which came from as a recommendation of the Cabinet on the 7th of February. It's on pages 79 to 118 of our agenda. May I call on Councillor John Williams, lead Cabinet Member for Finance, to move the recommendation of Cabinet, please. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, every year, as you know, we review and update our Treasury Management Strategy, and I ask that you approve the revised document attached to Appendix A. Uh, the changes uh, made are in red. Apart from changes that bring figures up to date, I should draw your attention to the decision to retain our minimum yield expectation at 2%. This is being kept under review because of the current inflation trends and given the target of the portfolio as a whole to, is to achieve a return above the Bank of England Consumer Price Index. So obviously we are keeping this under, uh, under review. But uh, otherwise, at the moment, um, we are retaining our minimum <coughs> yield at 2% on, on our investments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milnes. Do you have a seconder? I understand Councillor Brian Milnes might be seconding this. Oh, <laughs> oh so I am. <laughs> Good. So will you reserve your right to speak? I reserve the right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so, so members. We're open to the for debate. Councillor Bygott and Councillor Waters, I can see. Councillor Bygott first. Thank you, Chairman. So I have a question. Um, it's on page 92, uh, the third paragraph down, uh, beginning with the word strategy. So Councillor John Williams has mentioned uh, inflation uh, as he was talking. Um, so it says here that to achieve the objective above, 
the council has set a target based on CPI inflation, and then at the end, inflation is expected to peak at 6% in April 2022 and then subside. So my question is, how quickly uh, is he expecting it to subside, and what would the impact be if it doesn't su subside? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bygod. Councillor Williams. Council uh, well, first of all, you should ask your government that, um, because we don't know your Point government's financial chairman. strategy. And secondly, uh, as, as I have said, we will John review Williams, this. Would you pause one moment, please? Point of information from Councillor Heather Williams. I believe uh, well, that. actually from Councillor Bygod, it should be, really. But <laughs> um, well, as you said quite rightly last meeting, Chair, it is our government and things should go through you. Sorry? Councillor Williams, it's not do carry our on. government, it is our government. Councillor Williams, would you like to carry on? Uh, well, it's not my government, so it's not our government. It is a Conservative government. And, and I will go back to the point Members, that could you just you, you, your, the Conservative government sets the financial strategy for this country, so therefore you should be asking them if inflation will be coming down. If it doesn't come down, then clearly, as I said, we have it under review and we will take appropriate action. Um, but at the moment, we are waiting to see if the expectation that inflation will come down will happen. Thank you. Councillor Bunty Waters. Sorry, Councillor Waters, could you just come a little bit closer to your microphone, please? Page 97, uh, the top paragraph, F yield. On the last line, it is saying, how often, I'm asking how often are you defining the word regular in that paragraph? So regular yes. review, you're saying it needs to be kept under regular review. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Williams, John Williams, sorry. Um, every day. Thank you. Uh, wow. Thank you. The next question, Councillor Heather Williams. <laughs> Councillor Heather Williams. A daily review. I think that will be um, quite a challenge for officers. So I'll look forward to my next question, asking what the that day's review is. Um, on page ninety-seven, we've we've referenced this about showing the yield to decrease to two percent on investment. I I do have a concern that that means that other investments may be subsidised in less performing ones, and that's how we're taking it. But also, that to achieve the outcomes that you need, to achieve the amount of money that the council will need for this to generate, means that we will have to be investing more. And the more we invest, the, the more risk we get. So I have that concern. On page 107, unfinanced capital expenditure. I think we all know what that really is, um, which is the need to borrow and on Annex C we can see the external borrowing and we can see that it's gone up from 2021 to 2025 it's planned to go up over 100 million. I've said before it is the rate of the increase chair of borrowing that I really do worry is unsustainable for this council to withhold. Um, I'd also point out that on page 194 we have the council tax yield referenced at just shy of 10,500. This external borrowing will be 34 times that figure. Now, I would never be able to get a mortgage for 34 times my regular salary. And that does concern me, Chair. And I do think, you know, whatever party political things you have in, um, have in mind of governments and everything else, we are here to judge it for residents, and I very much am concerned about this borrowing and the rate of increase, because it's just not sustainable long term. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I can't see any other speakers, so Councillor Brian Mills. I'd just like to commend uh, this uh, Treasury Management Strategy to the Council. I invite us to vote on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, members, uh, I'm hearing that we might need a vote, so let's take it to the vote. So, those in favour of the... Sorry, uh, sorry Chairman, I'm, I'm putting my hand up oh, again and sorry, it's not... Sorry, Do apologise. 
No, Sorry. no, no problem, Chairman. It's and very don't worry, because I do understand there can be a bit of a delay on, yes. on the stream. So do carry on, uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Again, I have to share Councillor Heather Williams' concerns here, and I would like to know from the portfolio holder, if our concerns prove to be uh, come to fruition, uh, and I really can't think that the amount that we are jumping up, the great increase, is anything but unsustainable. What is the plan B? Every every business um, and every organisation should always have a plan B. If this does go bottoms up or, or the other way around, um, what is black pa pa plan B to get us out of it? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor John Williams, you can respond to that if you wish to, but since Councillor Roberts put her question after the vote, the recommendation was seconded, you can choose not to if you don't like to. I think, Chair, I must, I must point out that the majority of this borrowing comes about by this council taking out a loan from the Public Works Loan Board of £205 million in order to pay the government its... Um, council uh, rents. Now we all agree to that. I'm not quibbling that, that, but you know, let's let's be honest here. The bulk of our borrowing is that 205 million pounds. So can we please take that into account when you start criticising the level of borrowing of this council? Point of personal explanation, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, for clarity, Chair, I am being honest, um, and I have expressed the rate of increase. That is the main concern. There were reasons for that borrowing, Chair, but as I, I think the lead member might have under, misunderstood, the real concern here is the rate of increase. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I think we'll go to the vote then. So, we're voting on the Treasury Management Strategy. Uh, page 79 to 118 and those who wish to vote in favour of the Treasury Management Strategy press the green button, those who wish to oppose press the red button, those who wish to abstain press the yellow button. I think we're all done, uh, that's 17 in favour, 9 against and 1 abstention. The motion is carried. So not the motion, the recommendation is carried. Um, I did wonder about that. We've only got 27. Has anybody left? Let's just do a quick count around the room. Is anybody's microphone? That's mm. the correct number. Yeah. It's right. Okay, fine. So we're 19 in favour, nine against, and one abstention. So that is uh, recommendation is carried. Thank you. Moving on, uh, I'm going to try and go to four o'clock before we stop, folks. So. Moving on to item 8F, the capital strategy uh, was a recommendation from Cabinet on the 7th of February 2022. It's covered on pages 119 to 138 of our agendas. Can I call on Councillor John Williams uh, to lead member for finance to move the recommendation of Cabinet, please? Thank you, Chair. As with our Treasury Management Strategy, our Capital Strategy is reviewed annually, and this report uh, attaches the updated strategy, Appendix B, which I ask you to approve. Once again, the changes are in red. The changes ensure that the Capital Strategy meets the requirements of the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accounts Prudential Code. 
the changes to the public works loan board rules mentioned previously and the introduction of an infrastructure funding statement which local authorities must now produce in respect of section 106 and community infrastructure levy contributions. So I hope these changes are not controversial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have a seconder for that? I believe Councillor Bill Handley might be seconding. <laughs> Don't look so shocked. Would you like to reserve your right to speak? Okay, thank you. So, would anybody like to speak on this? Councillor Heather Williams, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, on page 113, paragraph 9.3, it does say about the change to PWLB. Um, and I think those changes were necessary, actually, to, due to the investments that authorities were starting to use using that public source of funding. Um, and I'd also say that that should be a warning as well to councils and local authorities um, to, be, to be mindful of how and why they borrow. On page 107, para 4... Can I just check? Are you looking at the right papers, Councillor Williams? We're talking at 8F. We're looking at capital strategy on page 119 onwards. The, the references you've referred to are... Could you do the paragraphs? Could you give the paragraph references? Thank you. Sorry, I appreciate the numbers are different online. Or if you'd like to give us the numbers from, if you're looking at the actual strategy document, you could give us the... Chairman, I'm trying to scroll through. It's going to take a bit of time, so right. it, I'm not supporting it. That may make it simpler. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. If you'd like to come back later, then do. Okay. Anybody else wish to speak? No. Anyone able to do a search on Public Works Loan Board? Find out where it was? Okay, right on. I can't see any other requests to speak, and if Councillor Heather Williams is happy to rest at that point, just clear that we know that you're not wishing to support that's fine so yeah we've moved to the vote um oh sorry first of all we need to um ask councillor handley if she'd like to speak. i'm happy to go to a vote <laughs> thank you okay so members uh if you want to support the capital strategy uh, press the blue button and then green if you wish to uh, object to the strategy blue button and then red uh, if you wish to abstain, it's yellow. I think we're still 29 in the room, aren't we? That's interesting. It's showing 27 at the present, and nobody not voting. Has everybody... Are we, are we, oh, 28, I think we're still 29 though, aren't we, in the room? Bingo. Right. Okay. We've got 29 votes recorded. That's 19 in favour, uh, 9 against, and 1 abstention. So that recommendation is carried. Thank you. Item 8G then, members. Housing revenue account, the revenue and capital budget for 22-23. 
a recommendation from Cabinet of the 7th of February 2022, and it's pages 139 of our agenda to 182. So may I call on Councillor John Williams, lead Cabinet member for Finance, to move the recommendation of Cabinet, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you know, the Council's housing revenue account is a ring-fenced account for the Council stock of around 5,500 Council homes, and therefore it has its own revenue and capital budget plans, which I ask you to approve for the coming financial year. By law, we cannot subsidise our Council housing revenue costs from the General Fund, and therefore, broadly speaking, must rely on rents from our tenants and capital receipts from right to buy Section 106 receipts and borrowing, etc. Following a four-year 1% cut in social rents by the government to 2020, rents have been permitted to rise by the, the Consumer Prices Index plus 1%. Given the small amount of funding received from government for new social housing in South Cairns, rents must play a significant part in enabling us to deliver new council housing not only to replace those lost through right to buy, but also to increase the stock to meet the needs of those on our housing waiting list. So we have to increase rents by 4.1% to continue to provide a good service to our tenants and build more homes for rent for those wanting council housing. Income from rents will be over 31.5 million out of a total income for the HRA of over 34.5 million. So you can see how important council house rents are. As to capital, the HRA budget for this coming financial year includes investing 17 million to build new energy efficient council homes and over 7 million in improving existing stock as part of our business plan priority to continue to bring forward housing that is truly affordable to live in. So I ask you to approve this HRA budget for the coming financial year to enable us to continue building more council homes and improving those that we already have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, do you have a seconder? Oh, Councillor John Batchelor, thank you. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Uh, reserve my right, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Batchelor. So, uh, Councillor Nigel Cathcart, thank you. Hello, you're here. Councillor Cathcart, would you like to speak? I think you're on mute, Councillor Cathcart. Oh, you were briefly unmuted. There we are. Oh, good. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I should have declared an interest earlier. I, uh, I rent a, uh, a garage from the council for my vintage Riley, so <laughs> that needs to be noted. Um, uh, the other point is really on rents. Uh, I mean, basically, looking at the figures, looking at the strategy, um, it looks a reasonable balance between uh, the rents and what can be afforded and what we need to do. And clearly, as John Williams pointed out, a substantial or a buy and share of what we need does have to come from rental income, and that's fully understood and, and accepted. Um, my only one of concern is that um, the we distinguish, I think, between existing tenants where we're going to uh, increased by 4.1% and the possible increase to new tenants. Now, there's a, there is a, an indication that we could increase it by up to 80% of, um, uh, of, uh, of market rents in the future, perhaps. Uh, and also, if you look at the documents, I note on page 145, the, uh, the average affordable rent is about £146, um, presumably per week. Um, and ours is only about £109. So um, my concern, and it may be an invalid concern, is that at some stage in the medium term, we may actually be pushing up our rents to a, an awful lot more by up to a third beyond what we are at the moment. I know it's existing council policy uh, to, to, to cap rents at about 4.1%, which I think is a, you know, a reasonably comfortable figure. But I think we have to recognise that, by and large, those our council tenants are those on 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 on, on lower incomes, and perhaps are are, are less able to afford uh, higher rents in the future. So, really, it's a point of clarification, in fact, you know. And really, I think I'm looking for some sort of comfort that there are no 
uh, their own plans to increase rents in the future very significantly indeed, which there's a possible implication of that in these figures. Thank you very much. Clarify your declaration at the beginning was because you rent a council garage, wasn't it? That's right, for my vintage driver. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, does anybody else wish to speak on this? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I'm very unhappy about it. Um, once again, we don't, never seem to take into account what the ordinary man in the street is finding upon their doorstep at this moment in time. There is terrible effects, and it's not just about this government. It's right across Europe um, and beyond uh, where there's huge pressures on um, ordinary people um, because of the problems with uh, fuel, etc., etc. And, and I really find it very difficult to understand how we can be so couldn't care less um, about people who are living on very meagre incomes. Um, it's all right, here we are asking for a, over 4% increase, while the other councils and the police, etc., etc., are also um, upping the game and upping their incomes. But for our residents, there's no way of upping their incomes. They're either living on their savings or their retirement money, money that they've probably put into pensions funds all their lives, and they're finding it getting more and more hard to cover everyday living. I find it amazing to hear a Labour councillor describing that an average rent is only £109 a week. Only £109 a week. To some of the people that we say we serve, that's a huge amount of money out of their uh, weekly income. They've got no way of extending their weekly income. And I would have thought we could at least have tried a little bit ourselves and not put up their rents. Yeah, it's okay for those people who won't be paying any rent for whatever reason. But for those people who are actually going out and earning and trying to keep a roof over their heads and being independent in the old working class way that my family did Councilor and looking Roberts, after their own family. Do, do, yeah, you have one minute remaining. Yeah, you like to sum up? Yeah, uh, I, if I was there, I would absolutely be voting against this. I find it so difficult to understand how Liberal Democrats and Labour can um, go along with this. You're supposed to have social consciences. It's supposed to be the, uh, the, the people on the blue um, line that haven't got them. So I hope that the Conservatives will vote against this. I think it's an absolutely abhorrent thing to be doing at this moment in time to decent people. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Councillor, thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Just on the other item, my page reference was the same. It was page 133, power 9.3. Is um, that on the previous item? On the previous item, yeah. yeah. So that was uh, was correct. Um, in relation to this, now that the HRA is something that traditionally we've normally all agreed on because I think as a principle we all, you know, the, we are a district council, we've fought to keep our council housing and we want to see that expand. Um, so this it's been a, a difficult item uh, for myself and I'm sure others to look at. I, I would like to reassure Councillor Roberts that myself and I'm sure my colleagues do have social consciences um, and that one thing that we don't talk about enough in South Cambridgeshire is fuel poverty. Because of our high dependency on oil, as I know some areas are supplied by gas, but in places such as mine, oil and oil prices, and that's the only form you have of heating, comes at a very difficult thing because not only do you have an expensive form of heating, but you have to come up with an upfront cost. And that upfront cost can be very difficult with the changing prices. So having looked at, um, looked at this in, in great detail, 
and looking particularly at Appendix B on page 175, where we can see that we do have the flexibility here to not increase rents. We do have those carry forward balances of, of multiple millions. I do think that while I completely support the capital program elements of this, I can't support putting up people's, you know, their rents at this time, particularly to the maximum. Had it been a different figure, it might have been a different answer. So, Chair, I would like to move that we take recommendations A to F separately to G to I, because I think it's important where we can agree we should. Um, I, I can't agree to putting up council rents to the maximum that is allowed, um, but I do believe that there is sufficient flexibility to do the capital programme regardless of rent increases. So, Chair, I would like to move that we take to for clarity the housing revenue the review of rents and charges separately to the capital. Thank you. So, Councillor Williams, uh, I'm quite happy to take recommendations 3A to 3F separately to recommendation 3G to 3I. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Smith, would you like to turn your mic uh, I'd like us to take advice about that, about whether we can actually split, split those, please. I've taken advice. The legal advisor has said Yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied that the council can split the split the two votes. I think what we decided was we were taking the recommendations on block. We could have taken them each part individually and members could have voted on each one, but I'm happy that we do um, take the vote in the, the way the chair so, so does the decision to do that rest with the chair or do we need to, or do the members get to decide whether to split it or whether to take it on block, please? I think the gift is within the chair. It's the chair's gift. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Um, just one moment. I will just consult. Can you pause? Uh, I'm advised that's um, acceptable. So, does anybody else wish to speak on this item? No. Thank you. I can see Councillor Hull, Councillor Bygott in the other order. And I saw a hand from... So, point, point of order, Chair. Yes, the, certainly. Right, this, this capital, the revenue and capital programme is based on the increase in council. Um, so, you can't support the capital programme if you don't increase the council rents, because the council rents are supporting the capital programme. Point of personal so you explanation, can't, So Chair. you can't split it up in that way. Okay, thank you, Councillor John Williams. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, thank you, Chair. So I did reference and, and preempted this potential um, conflict that people may find. Appendix B on page 175 shows carrying forward balances now, an increase that this would propose is well within those boundaries. So you would still be able, it is mathematically and financially possible to do the capital programme while not increasing the rents. It's, it's there on page 175. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, so, Councillor Tom Bygott. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> so I'd like to also uh, talk about the uh, increase in rents and about inflation. Uh, as Councillor Roberts and Councillor Williams mentioned, uh, prices of fuel. So our economy has had an external price shock uh, because fuel, uh, because oil and gas prices have increased. And if you cast your minds back to what happened in the 1970s with the OPEC oil crises, there's a danger that that will feed on into general inflation. Typically, when those sorts of things happen, there is a call for individuals to show uh, wage restraint. So to show restraint in asking for higher wages. So my question is, why should individuals show restraint in, high, in asking for higher wages when large institutions don't show restraint in wanting to increase their rents? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I don't 
know that that actually requires an answer. Um, sort of speculative thought, isn't it? So, John Williams, would you like to respond to that? For those families who are council tenants on low income, there is, of course, universal credit. There is, of course, housing benefit. There is advice that our housing officers give to help those people. Um, I think all that happens when you freeze something, and we'll come on to this with council tax, is that those who are better off get a better deal, and those that aren't don't get anything. And for most of those people on low incomes whose rents are already paid for them, they won't see any of this. It's the people who are, who, who are better off that will benefit from not putting up our council rents. Because for those people on low incomes, most of the time their rents are already paid for them. Quite the personal explanation, Chair. Um, fair enough, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, to clarify, when I spoke, I didn't say that it uh, essentially a freeze. I said, actually, if we weren't going for the maximum, this conversation could be very different. Um, the lead member has, I'm sure unintentionally, suggested that we've said no increase, although that would be preferable, but we're saying no to the maximum increase legally allowed. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, you'd, you'd already registered to speak. Is there anything else you wish to say? No, okay. Okay. Councillor Howell, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I have been in the position um, opposite of setting council rents for many years. I did that position. And for many years, I was quite happy to set the council rents. And in fact, we went for target rent with regards to social housing. And that was what we were trying to do for many years. I don't believe, however, this is the time we should be setting council rent. And it seems to me bizarre that the um, Conservative group, which is often labelled nationally the nasty party, is now asking for not to be put up to the maximum amount of rent. I appreciate that this could be quite difficult to try and achieve today because figures have been set and things have been looked at. But I ask um, uh, for the opposition party or the controlling party to look at this quite carefully. Um, I, an approximate rise of rent of £350 um, a year it is going to go quite some way towards fuel bills, which we know have gone rocketed high. And therefore, I will not be able to, and I'm sad that I can't support this, because I do believe that we have to keep on putting a lot of investment into our council housing. I will not be able to support this, and for the first time, I will be voting against this. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Hull. I can't see any other hands wishing to speak, so I'm going to come to John, Councillor John Batchelor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and through you, perhaps we would um, ad address the, the issue on uh, council rents. Um, the option, as I understand it, is not there to actually uh, increase rents by our own choice of how much we can increase it. The formula from government is, as it is, 3.1 plus 1. Percent. Uh, so the uh, choice before us is not to increase it at all or to increase it by the level that is prescribed by government. When we, uh, if we, we are, as you see, proposing that we do um, accept the levels that the government is, is uh, allowing. Sorry, Chair, and in, in that case. Uh, Councillor Batchelor, would you pause for a moment? Councillor Heather Williams. No, Thank I you, Chair. I don't think that's the way you work, actually, Chairman, if you don't excuse me. I should actually be allowed to finish my uh, speech before any interruption. Okay, if Councillor Batcher isn't prepared to give way, then carry on. Right. Thank you very much. Because we have had a, look, a number of interventions which perhaps should not have been allowed. Okay, having said that, um, the choice is we either put it up by the way, 4.1% or not at all. We're proposing the 4.1%, which still 
uh, meets all our criteria in terms of our local housing allowance. Uh, it meets the target levels and it is still significantly below the housing benefit level set by government. Um, so in those terms, it is affordable and the, the people in most need are protected, as Councillor John Williams has pointed out, with housing benefit. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity, uh, Chair, if I might, to actually congratulate our new build team who have uh, achieved more than doubling the number of houses, social and affordable houses built uh, in any one year. Uh, that is projected to be nearly 90 houses in this current financial year. And I'm pleased to be able to report there's a pipeline of more than 120 uh, houses um, which we have already contracted for. So we're investing in new housing, we're investing in the future, um, we're investing in zero carbon by 2050 by a huge amount of more than 440 million pounds over the next 30 years. So I recommend uh, this to the um, to members uh, and I hope you will vote for it. Thank you. Wait, thank you very much. Uh, no, we've had the summing up. Yeah, so been a we've had the summing made. up. Okay, point of information at this point then. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I was trying to actually assist there. It is not maximum or nothing. And I'm sure officers can confirm because we checked this ahead of the meeting. It is within our control to change this. Um, so that wasn't uh, reflective of advice that we've had. Just one moment. I just need to take some advice. Councillor John, Councillor John Williams, um, Peter Campbell has offered to speak on the matter of rental. If you wish, if you feel that would be useful, but not if you don't want to. Thank you, Peter Campbell. I believe you're online. Would you like to clarify? Yeah, the matter of rental? yeah, please, to, please to do that. So, um, what this rises from is when the government sets target rents. So when the council bought themselves out of the uh, national subsidy system, uh, there was a settlement from the government. Uh, they had to pay an amount, that's £105 million, which Councillor Williams referred to earlier. That was um, based uh, on a business model, which um, uh, meant that rents would increase by um, uh, inflation, plus 1% uh, every year uh, afterwards. Um, and then shortly afterwards, the uh, the government uh, went for their, for, the, for their rent reduction. They've now um, uh, confirmed moving forward uh, that rents can increase um, by, uh, again, by inflation uh, plus 1%, um, largely to service the debt ari um, arising from buying away out of the uh, national system, but it's entirely within the gift uh, of the council to decide the, um, at what level to set the rents. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. So I'm going to go to the vote now. Um, so those in favour of the recommendation? Oh, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, items 3A to 3F first. So, members, if you're in favour of 3A to 3F, that is the Housing Revenue Account Revenue, Review of Rents and Charges. Uh, if you are in favour of that, vote with the green button. And if you object, vote with the red button. And if you abstain, vote with the yellow button.
So, members, that is 19 in favour, 9 against and 1 abstention. So that 3A to 3F are carried. So if we move on to the second part, Councillor John Williams. Yes, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, but surely I should have had the right to re reply to the amendment. You haven't had an amendment. Well, there, there's an amendment to split the amendment, was to split the... We're taking the same the recommendations, Councillor Williams, as you had proposed, but just in two halves. But I didn't agree to that. is in the gift of the chair, I believe. Yeah. Okay. So, Councillor Smith? Might it be a good idea just to take a break, short break now? Not in the middle of a vote. Oh, sorry, no, I'm at the end of this, sorry. Yes, thought, uh, we sorry. will be. I'm ahead of myself. Through this vote. Thank you very much. So, members, we're looking now at items on capital, 3G, 23I. Those in favour? Vote with the green button. Those against, vote with the red button. And those wishing to abstain, yellow. One more to vote. No, it's, I've got 28 on my screen. Yes, I know, I'm waiting for one. Yeah. Has anybody had difficulty registering their vote? We're missing one. Just bear with us, members. Good, we got up to 29 now, that's excellent. And the voting is 27 in favour of uh, 3G to 3I and two abstentions, so those are also carried. Thank you, members. I'm going to call a pause now uh, for, what do we need, 10 minutes? So back at uh, 10 past four, please.
two hours and counting, folks. So, thank you. Welcome back uh, to Full Council on the 22nd of February. So, we're on item 8H on page 183 of our agendas. We're looking at the general fund budget for 2022-23, the recommendation of Cabinet on the 7th of February. May I call on Councillor John Williams to move the recommendation of Cabinet, please. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Well, this is what we've been waiting for, the budget for the coming financial year from April. Firstly, I wish to congratulate the finance team, and particularly the Deputy Head of Finance, for the way the report is set out. I present to you positive budget plans that put the environment at their heart, and demonstrate exactly how we are working to tackle climate change on a very local level in South Cambridgeshire. So I recommend that you approve the recommendations. We continue to endeavour to increase annual income sources and reduce annual expenditure without materially reducing frontline services provided by this council. This has not been made easier by the government's financial settlement being for one year only instead of the three years councils were promised. We know that local people quite rightly expect us to be taking action to deal with the climate emergency that we face, and these budget plans are proof of how our ambitions are embedded across the Council. From our business plan, there are also, of course, important contributions towards our other priorities of providing housing that is truly affordable to live in and growing local businesses and economies. As you can see from Appendix A, nearly a third of the gross expenditure of the Council has to be met from taxation and grants. The rest of the funding comes from sources outside of the Council's control, including business rates and grants such as the new Homes Bonus. Raising our, ship, our small share of the total Council tax bill paid by householders by £5 a year for Band D property to 160.31 pence is the equivalent of a 10p a week increase. This means that we can continue delivering key frontline services that residents rely on, as well as enabling us to work, keep working on our ambitious zero carbon action plan and strategy. Band D represents the average property in South Cambridgeshire with 65,431 such equivalent properties estimated in the 2022-23 financial year. We understand that for other reasons, beyond the control of this council, that households are facing a financial storm this year. So I'm pleased we have a number of measures to help residents with their council tax bill if they need support, including the local council tax support scheme, which we have already voted on, and more officers to help them. And not to forget that even with our £5 a year increase, our council tax charge remains in the lowest 25% in the country. The council's gross expenditure for the financial year is expected to be over £80 million, with £25 million to be found after allowing for incomes from savings, investments, pension adjustments and our shared service partners, etc., before contributions from reserves and taxation and grants. The new council tax charge will bring in 10.7 million of that 25 million. With business rates and grants making up the rest, we estimate we will deliver a balanced budget with some 2.1 million going into general fund reserves, including 1.1 million from the business rates pool to the renewables reserve, bringing the total of that reserve to 4 million, thereby helping us with our zero carbon. And I make the point that we are one of the few district councils in this country to be bad budgeting a balanced budget this year. Most are, are, have a deficit. This is a very good financial position to be in, given the current circumstances. The total amount expected to be spent on capital costs, that being purchased, that being purchasing equipment, vehicles and property, is expected to be around 48 million. A total of over 6 million is earmarked for projects, services and equipment that tackle climate change on a local level in South Cambridgeshire. Through the Council's Zero Carbon Strategy and Action Plan, it is supporting the district to halve carbon emissions by 2030 and reduce them to zero by 2050. 
Climate change related projects featured in the proposed budget include installing a solar farm at the Water Beach Depot of the Shared Waste Service. This solar farm would power the council's growing fleet of electric bin lorries and support vehicles and vans. Equipment and activities to tackle climate change at Greater Cambridge Shared Waste, such as the purchase of the new electric bin lorries. In 2020, Great Cam Cambridge's Shared Waste began using Cambridge's first electric bin lorry, and I understand that there are two more uh, due to be delivered. Initiatives to improve and adapt waste services, encouraging recycling and minimising waste. Maintenance of the 275 kilometres of awarded watercourses, which crisscross through the district, and the council is responsible for maintaining. This is very apt given the current storms that we are facing and the rising water uh, levels. The Council Zero Carbon Community Scheme, which provides financial support to parish councils and community groups to provide greener initiatives and reduce their carbon footprint. The installation of electric vehicle charging points in the district and the completion of converting the council streetlights to energy efficient LEDs. Meanwhile, the council's retrofit of its Campbell office here um, is nearing completion. This plan includes measures to dramatically reduce energy bills and carbon emissions from the building. As the electricity grid continues to decarbonise due to new renewable energy generation schemes coming online, the carbon footprint of this building will reduce to 25% of current levels by 2030 and 10% of current levels by 2050, playing a major role in the reduction of the Council's own footprint. The work is also expected to help the Council avoid steep price rises in its energy costs. And that obviously will then work through to um, our Council tax bills. At the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, recognising that there is a shortage of planners Councilor that additional Williams. posts will not solve, there is, to to close. there is a new funding towards encouraging more apprentices to begin a career in planning. And the budget has an additional counter full post in our full team. For an extra 10 pence a week for the average household, this budget is a very good deal for the residents of South Cambridgeshire who have seen a transformation in the breadth of services now delivered compared to four years ago, whilst continuing to pay one of the lowest council tax charges in the country. So I hope you will agree and approve this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, can I ask, have you a seconder? I believe Councillor Peter MacDonald may be seconding this. Uh, yes, happy to second, Chair. Yeah. Do you wish to reserve your rights to speak? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So, members, uh, this matter is open for debate, but I understand the Conservative group would like to present your amendment. Which, can I just clarify, members, the amendment is on page 285, uh, the Conservative group budget proposal is on page 285 of our agenda, tucked in sneakily behind the rest of the budget. And uh, uh, just while we're there, I'll point to the Labour group budget suggestion is on page 287. Do go ahead, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. And I hope the chair's not implying that we sneaked this in. It did go through cabinet and everything else. Um, oh, I meant simply in terms of it wasn't very obvious in the papers. That was all. OK, thank you, chair. So um, our budget proposals are laid out in front of you. But um, I want to stress we have obviously on other agenda items spoken about the cost of living. And I think that's something that everybody is becoming more and more aware of. I appreciate the figures that were given in the moving of the original motion. However, if we look at the incremental increases that have happened for residents um, over the last four years, it will actually be £50 more a year than what they were paying four years ago. And that can be a weekly shop for a family of four. Um, I do think, and we have previously been very pragmatic, actually, about tax rises, and we have supported them. But in the current climate, I do think it is right to just give a, a pause. And perhaps for some, it is a goodwill gesture. As is, but actually, it would show a bit of unity with our residents that we respect the difficulties that are facing, people that are already just about managing. We also want to see some increased investment um, in relation to fly tipping and environment crime. I hope that's something we can all agree is an absolute blight in South Cambridgeshire. Um, and it should be enforced and we hope that this would help 
to prevent it in the first place and also enforce those who continue to do such um, disaster to our countryside. The fraud prevention, and I, I say this as an accountant and my original training uh, around tax, there is no obligation for anybody to pay a penny more tax than they need to, but they have every obligation to pay every single penny of tax that they owe. And with that, I bring, I bring that emphasis to this. It will never be possible to actually quantify how much you can save in fraud prevention. But I think it's very worth doing, and it, on a principal point of view, if people are defrauding the public purse, if they are defrauding the hard-earned money of residents, sometimes struggling to pay their bills, then they should be held to account. Planning enforcement. I think an extra officer, as I said at Cabinet, is needed, not just because of the volume of cases that there are now, but also the demands that some of these cases are taking. And there are some enforcement cases that are still on the agenda of our planning committees from the very first meeting that I sat at. The money needs to come from somewhere. And I think a, a good place is actually, again, with ourselves. Over the last four years, we've gone from 19 to 66 types of special allowances. And members are now also allowed to have two which means in previous times where there was 19, in theory, every one of us here could have two, and that would be 90 allowances. And I don't think that's right. We also say about taking the money from the Transformation Reserve, which originally was given approximately £4 million from the advice I've taken, and I, I don't feel that we're going to need that level of sums. So I would ask members to, to look at this carefully and and respect that increasing the, the tax for many people year on year on year um, is just making it harder for some, and we should be helping them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, do you have a seconder? I'm happy to second that, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams, can I ask whether you, sorry, Councillor John Williams, can I ask whether you and your seconder, as the mover and seconder of the original motion, indicate whether you're prepared to accept the amendment through its incorporation into your motion? No. Thank you. So we have a seconder for the amendment, Councillor Cohn. Um, can I ask Councillor Cohn, do you wish to speak now or do you wish to reserve your right? Uh, I'm happy to reserve my right to speak. Okay. Thank you. So, members, would anybody like to speak on the Conservative Amendment? I can see that Councillor Cathcart has his hand up online, but I'm... Councillor Cathcart, can you tell me whether that's, you wish to speak on the Conservative Amendment or whether that is for a later mm. item? No, that's just to, uh, to speak on the, on the Labour Amendment. OK, thank you very much. I'll pause at that point. I'll come back to you, Councillor Cathcart. So, Councillor Bhattacharya, Councillor Thank you. And I'll just that. say, um, Councillor Roberts, I can see that you've asked to speak also. So, Councillor Dr Bhattacharya, do go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. Thank you. I, I appreciate your presentation. Are you withdrawing your wish to speak at this point? Sounds like it. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Councillor Roberts, thank you. Thank you again, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. I think we need to be realistic here and really understand that because of the huge prices of property in South Cambridgeshire, you don't have to earn a mansion to be um, over Bandy. Um, so, in fact, there's an awful lot of people get caught up in having very large council tax uh, who are, they may be sort of uh, have the benefit of, a, of a, a little bit better house, but they haven't got any extra money. 
Um, and we are in that dreadful position around here of properties are just too expensive. Um, so we as a council adding to their um, problems, um, I think is very, very bad. Um, I don't think we need to add to the council tax at this moment in time. And it is this cumulative effect. As we've been saying earlier, everything for the ordinary man in the street is going up, whether it's uh, transport costs, keeping the house warm, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sorry to all you great green supporters, but I'm afraid the reality is that the um, alternative fuels are not going to be ready for many, many years, not to the amount that we'll need to keep our homes warm. So people will still be um, having to use gas. They will still be having to use oil. They will still be burning wood. They will still be burning coal. And the prices of all those commodities are rising alarmingly. So where's our conscience here? Where's our moral line that says we understand that we're only, I mean, all this about, oh, it's only 10p a week more. It's not true for most of the residents of South Cams. It's going to be many, many, many pounds more on top of everything else. Their food, look at, look at the food price. If you go into Tesco's now and you will see the rise in prices over the last eight or nine, ten weeks. It's, it's just alarming. And people are going to be desperate. And the people that are going to be desperate are the people who actually go out to work. If you're not going out to work and you're getting all your council tax, uh, everything paid for, that's fine. But that isn't going to be the majority of people. Um, the majority of people now are over that Roberts, line. Can I remind you to begin to sum up? Yeah, and, and our struggling chairman. So it really is upon us to try to do our best not to take extra money. We need to cut back. Thank you, we Councillor Roberts. We need to be realistic. You Thank you, Chairman. Of your time. Thank you very much. And I would remind members we're talking about the Conservative Amendment at the moment. Uh, other wish people wishing to speak? Councillor Ellington? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Others will speak on other things, and I agree with the whole um, proposal that we have put forward. But the one thing that I would like to stress is the need for an additional enforcement officer. The need for an enforcement officer is key to how much it costs the authority to deal with people who have not complied with planning um, in the way that if there is somebody available when a councillor or a member of the public or a clerk of, count, of parish council or whatever phones up and says Joe Bloggs is building that extension and it's just getting out the ground if there isn't somebody there to go and deal with that at that point and stop the building progressing it's up. And once it's up, it's even more difficult and more expensive to take down again and to actually enforce the planning decision. And the reputation of this council at the moment is that they don't bother to enforce very much because it's a bit too much of a bother. And I believe that that is not the way we ought to be presenting ourselves to our residents. They want planning permission made. Sometimes they'll disagree with them. But when a decision is made that something shouldn't happen, it shouldn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ellington. Uh, I I can't see any other request to speak on the Conservative Amendment. Sorry, I'd just, I'd just like to respond to something that Councillor Ellington's saying, because I assure you, Councillor Ellington, our officers care deeply and they try extremely hard. And actually, I really 
not terribly impressed at the implication that our officers don't care, you know, haven't, don't take pride in their job and are doing a half-hearted um, job of enforcement, because they absolutely do. So I'm afraid I take issue with that. Thank you. And I have Councillor Timmy Hawkins, Dr Timmy Hawkins, who'd like to speak. You need to turn your microphone on when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, through you, Chair. Um, I know the issue of enforcement is something that um, um, has been mentioned time and again. I just wanted to update um, actually on what is happening now with the enforcement team. Now, in January of this year, the Share Planning Service, supported by the Council's transformation team, started the initial work or naturally scoping out the project for review of the planning enforcement team. Um, and that program we expect will take about six months to complete. So we're looking at how it's operating now. The review includes assessing the overall workload and uh, the resources that we currently have is sort of seven full-time employment places. We've got two principals, three seniors, and one enforcement officer. Yes, there is a vacant manager position right now, but it is not different when compared with other similar size local authorities. Now, what this review will do is also to deliver opportunities to streamline our process um, and learn how to use the new uniform um, IDOC software that we use, which is not something that is used at the moment by enforcement. So really what we're doing is reviewing how current resources are deployed across the Greater Cambridge area. Um, so that we can make sure that we're using the staff we've got to the maximum that is possible. Now, enforcement workloads actually is probably not as high as you think it is. Um, just to let you know that in 2021, we had 439 cases, which is slightly less than what we had in 2020, which was 473. And in 2019, there was 705. So effectively, there's a lot less enforcement requests that, have, uh, that we've had. Um, now, of course, we can say that that number has been affected by COVID, which is fair enough. Um, but it's remained stable the last couple of years. So really, what we're saying is we recognize that Enforcement is an important thing to do. And bear in mind, it's not a statutory function, it's a discretionary function. So what we're doing is trying to update the process um, and ensuring that it's working efficiently now. So until we've done that review, we can't say we need an additional um, person because we already have provision for seven. So we'll know at the end of it whether or not we need more. But at this point in time, they are working and working well to deal with the issues that arise. Thank you. Could you use your microphone, Sorry. please, Councillor? Can I come back on a point of order? Um, not order, a point of clarification. And that is, I was not um, in any way inferring that our officers are not doing their job. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. That's fine. Um, thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Had you finished what you were saying? Thank you. Okay. Um, I can't see any other requests to speak on the debate, on the amendment. So I will come back to Councillor Cohn to comment on that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. I'll be brief. So, um, just to, to repeat on the um, council tax freeze, um, the reason we're proposing this this 
year um, uh, is because of the sort of backdrop that our residents are, are facing. Um, you know, it's not something that has to be ongoing. Um, you know, obviously we'll be looking at this every year, but I, I think given the situation this year with um, residents struggling as they are, I think that is a reasonable proposal, which is costed within these um, uh, amendments that we've put forward. And just building on the case for enforcement, I think all councillors have had issues of enforcement within their patches. And, um, you know, it, it really is important to our residents that those things are, are dealt with quickly and efficiently. Not because, as Sue um, says, um, because the officers are in any way not doing their job, but because they need the resources and the, and the staff allocation that is reasonable for a district like ours. And uh, it might be that the numbers are similar to that uh, across the country, but I think, you know, that councillors could cite many cases where, you know, enforcement is, is a difficult issue for them and, and our residents. So, um, and those enforcement officers are over two councils as, as well. They are over South Cams and, and the city, so. Um, but yeah, so I just, I hope um, we can support the uh, amendment that we've put forward. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Cohn. Right, having summed up the amendment, I'm going to come back to Councillor John Williams, who is entitled to speak on the amendment. I will also at this point just note that Councillor Peter MacDonald has left. Thank you. Councillor John Williams, will you proceed? Yes, but before I do, um, a point of information, I want to correct Councillor Roberts. Um, the council tax isn't based on current property values, but the value of a property that, that it would have been valued in 1991. So make that clear, they are not based on current values. Right, to, um, to pick up on the, my response to the various um, points that have been raised in this uh, amendment. First of all, picking up on fly tipping. Four years ago, fly tipping in this district was out of control and it took weeks to have it removed. We reorganised the way fly tipping was dealt with and have received praise for how quickly it is now removed. COVID restrictions over the past two years led to limits being imposed at the household recycling centres. However, the government now expects us to live with COVID and at this moment in time, it's not clear how this will impact on the future use of the centres and fly tipping. The logical assumption would be that it, that it will have a positive impact. Moreover, you can see from Appendix D um, in, in the full report, there has been an increased use of the bulk waste service, and there is an expectation that this will continue. So the evidence at this time does not support that proposal. Going on to um, fraud, four years ago, this council had no coordinated approach to fraud. We are pleased to see now that in opposition, the Conservatives accept we need to combat fraud. We set up the fraud team before the COVID pandemic, and they have been invaluable in supporting the distribution of the government COVID grants, totaling 45 million. We recognise there is a need for additional resource, and you'll see that we have increased the fraud team budget by 15,000 pounds. But once again, the government has said that we must live with COVID. So clearly there will be no more government grants. This gives us the chance to reassess the workload of the full team in future. Once again, we are being asked to increase council expenditure considerably on top of this increase without a plan going forward. Now we come to freezing council tax. The Conservatives know that a freezing council tax this year will lead to a £1.5 million hole in the revenue budget in five years' time. But they make no reference to this, other than saying it will have an ongoing effect on the Council's medium-term financial strategy. We are already facing a shortfall of several million in five years' time due to recent changes their government has made to limit our commercial investments. So you might have thought they would not mention this fact. Also, they give the impression that all the additional spending now proposing today will have little effect beyond next year, whereas the opposite is true. Is their policy to recruit more staff for the election year and sack them in the next? We have the responsibility of delivering good council services, not just this year, but for the future. 
and we take this responsibility seriously. That is why we have a transformation fund. At the moment, the transformation of this council is delivering something like £230,000 per annum. We need that fund to continue the modernisation uh, uh, and, the, and the transformation of this council and to raid it in order to keep um, council tax down would not solve that issue. Okay. And finally, on yeah. funding, I've explained Very that the proposed council zero Williams. council tax rise will have an impact on us beyond just this coming financial year. Assuming they intend to go back to a five pound council tax rise next year, the maximum we are permitted to increase the council tax by, this leaves us with having to find 1.5 million by the end of the five year period. Plus, of course, we'll also have to find 184,000 every year for their ongoing revenue Williams. costs. So this funding proposal just doesn't add up. Thank you. Um, right. So now I'm going to um, call for a vote on the Conservative amendment. Thank you. So we'll have the vote put up in front of us. So press the blue button first and make sure it registers your presence. Then, if you are in agreement, press green. If you oppose the amendment, press red. I don't think the vote is correct. <laughs> yes, it's my impartial view. Oh, you don't? Clarify. Oh, you don't. No, it doesn't make any difference. There you are. No, no. It's the amendment. It's the amendment. Oh, well, it's me who's voted incorrectly then. <laughs> uh, right, OK. So we're 27 in the room. That is correct. I apologise, and I will declare now I have voted the wrong way myself. So, uh, um, can I just register that I would have wished to vote against the amendment for myself? Please, members, just bear that in mind. I'd just like it to be recorded that I intended to vote against the amendment. Thank you. Now, we have a vote of 27 people. That is correct. We have 10 for 16 against, and those numbers will be adjusted according to my vote. Thank you. That means that the amendment fails. Thank you. Moving on to the next part, um, I, I know we have an amendment from the Labour group, and I would like to ask uh, Councillor Gavin Clayton if he would like to speak to the Labour amendment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, would no, you, no. I should say, sorry, just to butt in again, I'm sorry, that's on page 287 of our agenda. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, as, the, as the, the minority group here, I think, I don't know whether Deborah is the, the, the minority minority, is independent, so I don't know if there's more than one. Um, with Nigel, the, the change of day has meant that Nigel couldn't be here because he's got hospital appointments, which means that I have nobody to second these proposals. But I'm going to talk to them anyway in the hope that um, some of you might feel persuaded to uh, act as second on the day. So here goes, here's my, my pitch for a, somebody to second them so we actually have to go to a vote and maybe have them considered. Um, I was interested to hear from uh, Councillor John Williams about the success of um, South Cambridgeshire having a balanced budget um, and being able to move 2.1 million into general reserves. Um, and I would hope that that contributes to an ability to make some positive choices along the lines that the Labour group uh, are setting out today. Um, the first one refers to the benefit maximisation income officer role, which um, uh, has, has by all accounts been a great success and been very much used by residents across uh, South Cambridgeshire. And I just wanted to make sure that this is registered as something that can build on um, the successes that are referenced in page 52 uh, of, of the papers for this, for this meeting. Um, and I would hope that um, I, I, I've got a, a 
recollection of the first time I went through papers of seeing that there was an extension of it, but I think, I don't know whether I'm right about that, and maybe you could, you could um, let me know, uh, Councillor Williams, whether that is the case. But I think if, if not, there, there is a case, given the, the economic pressures on residents across South Cambridgeshire at the moment, there is, there is a case to be made for a, uh, another half or potentially another whole post um, to fulfil that, that function. The second point is around cultural strategy uh, development, which, as I said at the beginning, was mentioned in the previous meeting, uh, to which the leader of the council responded positively that this, this should be the case. And myself and um, colleagues from, from the controlling group have ha held several meetings al along uh, with uh, Councillor Hanley about cultural development. I think what, if we can identify a budget line for this work, what it does is that it, it it takes an opportunity that is there at the moment, but won't be there very soon, to work alongside one of the major cultural assets of South Cambridgeshire, i.e. Wising Arts Centre, who are ready and poised to, to move with this, if we can identify a budget line for their NPO application to the Arts Council to build in additional funds that will build on any money that can be identified within, South, within our district council's budget. If we don't take that opportunity now, that money that opportunity will, will go, and we won't have a chance to build it into their long-term strategy and um, to build that. I think given um, MIND's, uh, as in uh, the, the charity MIND's recent um, response to the levelling up paper um, from government around been... disproportionate impact to... Uh, Madam uh, Clayton, uh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Clayton, we've come to an end. Would you like to sum up? Well, that feels like a very short time. Um, the Scottish Government, for instance, are undertaking a review into cultural delivery by voluntary and community sector arts organisations and the positive role that that plays on the mental health of young people. Mental health of young people can be, I know from my professional experience, can be very positively impacted by um, cultural strategy and, and artistic uh, uh, activities of provision um, and the rates of mental health uh, within... A, poor mental health within children and young people across England at the moment is rocketing um, with hundreds of referrals coming in each week to local camp services. We have an opportunity to do something about it with this council, to use the fact that you've got a balanced budget, to use the fact that you, you've got that freedom, that wiggle room, to use something around the 40k mark, which given that you're dealing with a budget of tens of millions of pounds, 40k is a lot to an individual, but to a council operating on the size of budget that South Cams is, it's a drop in the ocean. And I think to invest it now, to potentially double or treble it over the next 12 months and forward into the next three years, would be a really forward-thinking uh, approach from this council. Thank you, and I would like to see that happen. Thank you for your points. Do you have a seconder? No, because Nigel's not here. Because no, okay. he didn't know the meeting in which case, Tuesday. No. It, 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 we go no further with that because we do not have a seconder. Well, Chair, I'll well, get to this because you, you sorry, allowed sorry. Councillor Clayton sorry, sorry. to put a case I, before you had a seconder and you are not giving me the right to reply to the points he made. Just give me one moment to get can I, can I, can I just... uh, As I understand it, if there is no seconder, the... the um, there is no, there is no amendment to Chair. ask you to incorporate. Chair, I'll, I'll happily Just, just I'll wait happily a moment, please, it, members. Uh, I'm going to take debate. legal advice. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Did somebody want to second the motion? Yeah, I'll second the motion just Thank so you, we Councilor can have Cone. the debate. And if, I think that's fair. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Go to debate. I Could I just also point out that partway through that, Councillor Harvey left the room. So that's why the numbers were low, uh, one down on the previous vote. Sorry, just to record that. So we now have a seconded motion. Councillor Williams, would you like to accept oh, that I'm... motion into your into your well, uh, can I speak? Would you like to incorporate that into your motion? No. Thank you. We now go to debate. Well, can I just please speak? Uh, sorry, who is asking to speak? Uh, Nigel oh. Cathcart. Sorry, I, just, I, one, I recall, just one I, moment, I, Councillor Cathcart. Just one moment. Thank you. Councillor Cohn, would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? 
Uh, I would like to reserve my right to speak. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So we go to debate. Councillor Cathcart, do go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I did record my uh, wish to speak quite early on in this debate. Yes, but we've only just got to the point at which you are able to do so. Do go okay. ahead now, Councillor okay, Cathcart. No, um, uh, <laughs> thank you. No, there's a, there's a sort of a common uh, a thread running through these proposals, which is to um, increase the and improve the range of quality of people's lives, um, to try to address uh, issues or, or facilities which are not being fully addressed at the moment, uh, but to, to, and to do it in a way which is cost effective and is within the resources of, of the council. Um, now, uh, my, my colleague has already sp spoken at length on a cultural uh, strategy, which I fully support. I'd just like to mention one or two other things there. Um, the, 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 the care and nursing home provision. Um, we are now, um, the country is now looking seriously at the way we actually provide provision for care. The proposal here is to build on what we already do via the warden assisted schemes, where we have an excellent record of actually looking after people. Um, but the proposal here is to look at whether we can take this further to work cooperatively cooperatively with other agencies, uh, with other councils, and to see if we can have a, some form of, of, of support or direct nursing home provision, which authorities years ago used to do. Um, to some extent, we're missing the point because the whole debate and argument is about how to fund private nursing and care home provisions, where we should be looking at whether local authorities like this, in collaboration with others, building on the experience we we'll already have, can actually do it. And I think um, Councillor Clayton has, has mentioned here that other authorities are looking seriously at this, and this is an opportunity uh, to do so. And all we're suggesting here is a feasibility study um, to see whether it's practical, sensible, affordable, and, and how we can actually do it collaboratively. Um, the other thing we need to look at is uh, green infrastructure. Yes, much of what, much of what the council is doing is excellent, um, uh, but we need to build on this and to, and to see whether we can, we can go further. Again, all we're suggesting is a, um, oh, is, 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 is a feasibility study to see what's possible. A small item on local composting, which we looked at previously on, on this council to see whether a pilot scheme is practical, which builds on the council's green initiative. And conservation grants, so high streets in many of our villages would benefit from such a scheme, which we had years ago, um, uh, and we do need to make sure that our conservation areas are protected and restored and also build on craft uh, skills uh, in the district, of which there are many, but we need to ensure they're preserved and enhanced. Uh, and I think the suggestion here is see if we can fund this from savings elsewhere in the uh, planning budget. So there's a whole range of issues here connected by a common theme, uh, which I think we could look at constructively uh, for the future and the long term uh, security and well-being of our residents. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Cathcart. I apologise. I, I had assumed that you wanted to speak on either the substantive or the, the, amend, the, the Labour amendment. Thank you for your thoughts. Right. OK, so Councillor Howell, I'm assuming you wish to speak on the Labour amendment. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I won't actually be referring to the Labour amendment. I will leave that up to the Deputy Leader of the Conservative Group to do that. Um, I'm just Sorry, but that is what we are speaking on. I'm just moment. going to say, Chairman, there was a reference made to the charity Mind, and therefore I think it's only right to be said that I am a member of Mind and have been for the last 15 years. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And while we're about it, I just want to check that Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya wishes to speak on the substantive or on this Labour amendment. Can I just check with you? Substantive. On the substantive. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so we've had a declaration of interest from Councillor Howell on the fact that he's a member of MIND. Councillor Khan, do go ahead. In terms, I wanted to speak briefly about the issue of cultural strategy development, because uh, I'm also a member of the, uh, the, the group that is uh, looking at this. Uh, it's most unfortunate that the... Uh, the on, on what, Councillor on Khan? The, cult just... the element of the Labour group um, Proposals regarding cultural strategy, cultural, cultural strategy. strategy development. Right, Fine. Um, Sorry. Because this is, a, a, I've been in, involved in the group that's looking at cultural strategy. It's clear that we want to make forward. It's unfortunate that this 
um, has come through at this time when we have not, we've only really in the very, very early stages of, of looking at this. Um, and it's clear that action will be taking place. Um, uh, it's difficult for us to, as far as I can see, to make a commitment at this time when we don't know which way the strategy is going to go. Uh, we can't really make a commitment in the procedural process to one particular partner uh, without going through a long procedure, and the time scale is too short. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, I would hope that during the year we'll be able to look to find uh, resources, if necessary, in this year, but it may not arise in this year, so I think it's too uncertain. But um, I hope that in the future I certainly will be pushing for some provision on this line, perhaps in the next year's budget. Thank you very much, Councillor Khan. Could I ask members to be a bit quiet during people making presentations? Thank you. To do them the courtesy that they do you. Thank you. Councillor Handley. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Yes, I, I would echo what um, Councillor Khan has said. Um, we do have a genuine interest in the cultural strategy. Uh, I'll say that to, uh, through you to, to, to Councillor Clayton. Um, there is some money in the budget as it is um, for, for progress, possibly not as much as you would like, but there is money there. And I would also say and add that our mayor is actually keen on, on the cultural strategy, uh, so there may perhaps be some money coming from that direction as well. Um, apart from that, uh, unfortunately I can't support this motion, but um, I can assure you that we will be picking up this cultural strategy and going, working with you and others in... Uh, well, depending on what happens in May, I guess. Thank you. Councillor Daunton? I'd like to echo that as another member of the group working on that with them. Thank you very much. I have no other people. Oh, Councillor Heather Williams? Um, yes, just to say that um, however people vote on, on this, um, I think if you support it, you should vote for it. If you don't support it, don't vote for it. But don't say you support it and then not vote for it. Thank you, Councillor Heather That's Williams. I shall be coming back to Councillor Cohn now as the seconder. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I will be supporting this um, amendment. I understand that, you know, not all of my group will be, um, but I have been convinced by the argument, especially around the, the funding for cultural spending. I think this is actually quite a small amount in the grand scheme of things. It's 40k, so I think that's really small in, in the scheme of this budget and I recognise the benefits of um, art and culture um, especially around mental health so I think that um, I'm happy to second it, I'm happy to vote in favour of it. Thank you very much. So well, I'm going to go to a vote on the amendment. No. Oh sorry, no. Councillor John Williams, sorry. Do go ahead. Thank you Chair. Right, I pick up the points that have been raised. Okay, the uh, council tax uh, and safeguards. In addition to the officer already in place, we've made provision for three housing advice officers who will not only help council tenants, but also other people who are at risk of losing their homes or have money difficulties. I should also add that citizens advice receive 85,000 pounds a year to support South Cambridgeshire residents. So, you know, we are already doing what you're asking us to do, and more. Um, on the cultural strategy, we've heard that, that you know, the development of cultural strategy is in a very embryonic stage, um, and really there is no um, you know, um, report yet to enable us to start hanging things on it, to enable us to then assess the, the cost. And you know, just plucking 10,000 pounds out of the air um, to be honest, we, we can deal with that within um, we, we can deal with that within the existing budget. Uh, we've also recently beefed up the community chest fund, which is open to cultural groups, and increased the maximum award to two thousand pounds. The community team has also been reorganised, and being more proactive, support is being given to well-being in our communities, particularly as they come out of COVID. So there is ample opportunity for cultural groups to seek assistance including match funding, and indeed we look forward to such community-based groups coming forward. We have asked that a communications plan is developed to support this. And as we go on through the next year, and it becomes evident that we need to have a, a more um, detailed approach uh, planned and framework to, to our 
cultural strategy, then that's the time to come back and put something in the budget for it. On nursing uh, and care home provision, um, thank you for acknowledging the role of the expanded community warden scheme and the excellent work done by wardens to help people stay in their own homes for longer. This is very much based on the premise of supporting local communities, usually parish councils, in their wish to provide a basic service for their residents who are at home and have mobility difficulties. While we understand your concern, we see the provision of something more than this as a matter for the county council as the social care provider. And no doubt as we come to the integrated care um, development of that, that will then become part of, part of that. Um, on green infrastructure, um, we are already engaged with partners, including the County Council, in investigating possibilities for green energy infrastructure investment, drawing on the experience of other councils, such as Lib Dem Controlled South Somerset, which has an extensive green energy investment portfolio and are accommodating the feasibility costs within the existing budget, so we don't need to um, put £10,000 aside for that. On local composting, uh, you're quite right, this has been done in the past, um, or has been considered in the past, but found to be impractical. We believe our curbside household collection with the facilities available to us at Walter Beach is much more effective in engaging all residents in composting and delivering good quality free compost material. However, we are aware that not everyone can avail themselves of the compost, so we are considering how to provide local collection points for it. And finally, on conservation grants, um, if, if, if we, in an ideal world, we, we could give uh, money to um, everybody to enable them to, to um, repair Please. their homes. The fact is that we can't, but we are prepared over the next year to look at some sort of way in which we can help those who haven't the means to come, for, to come and apply uh, for grants to do it. But at the moment, there isn't, there isn't Williams, the, um, the plan to there yet, Thank you. again, to hang... Thank you for your um, to, Again, look, you gave Councillor Clayton an extra two minutes. I'd be grateful if you gave me the same opportunity. So we don't have the scheme yet to be able to decide how much we require to do that. So at the moment, I'm afraid that we can't take that forward, but we will be over the coming year. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Right. We are. Need to uh, no, Councillor. No, you need to apologise. Sorry. Just one moment. Just one moment. We have gone through the debate. You have had an opportunity to reply, and Councillor Williams has now responded as the person, as a proposer of the motion. I did notice that. Yes, I'd noticed that. Thank you. The spelling mistake is noted. Thank you. Right. Ch Chair, I wish to apologise for my... Uh, Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Williams, the reason I, did, I uh, was sharper than you might have thought with you was because I accidentally gave Councillor, Councillor Clayton too short a time. So the comparison might have seemed unfair to you. <laughs> so I was correcting the error that I'd made earlier on. Thank you for your apology, which I accept. Right, let's move to a vote then, folks, on the Labour Amendment. Making sure we understand what we're doing this time. So, if you wish to vote for the Labour Amendment, vote blue and then green. And if you wish to vote against the amendment, register yourself on the blue button and then vote red. If you wish to abstain, vote yellow. And I think 27, 28, thank you. So the votes I can see are 20, sorry, six in favor of the amendment, 21 against the amendment and one abstention. Uh, so that amendment fails, thank you. Right, that brings us back to the substantive So, uh, does anybody wish to speak on the substantive motion, or have we all talked ourselves out? The only person who'd registered to speak on that was Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya. 
And Councillor Heather Williams. So, Councillor Bhattacharya, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. And Councillor Smith. Uh, Councillor Smith. Just one moment, Councillor Smith. Sorry, could I just run something past the monitoring officer, please? Um, uh, Councillor, um, sorry, Brian, uh, sorry, Peter McDonald seconded it, this, yes. and he's had to leave because of his That's health. Fine, I did check that, now. and because Councillor Peter McDonald had seconded the motion before he left, that's okay. But obviously he doesn't, he didn't have an opportunity to speak. Okay, that's it's fine. Perfectly acceptable. My apologies for interrupting. Yes. So, just one moment. Um, Councillor Hales, you have your hand up. Can I just clarify on what matter you want to speak? I just want to check that I'm able to vote because I walked Peter down to the car. So um, I, I, I observed that too, and I was advised that since you were out of the room for a very short time, it was up to you whether to decide whether you'd missed a load uh, and whether you felt able to take part in the vote. I definitely got the gist of it, put it that way. So will you be voting or not? Uh, if I may. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm happy with that. Thank you. Councillor Dr Bhattacharya, you wanted to speak. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Could I ask you to speak number clearly into your microphone and bring your microphone a bit closer, please? Uh, page number 275 and page number 276, I'm asking... Are uh, these figures are realistic? At the at the volume of seven, at the volume of savings on the page number two seven six, realistic giving that for the because the previous two budgets we are having we we have been told or warned that savings will be harder and harder to come by. I'm just asking on these figures are are they realistic? I mean, this figure realistic to me. So, Councillor Bhattacharya, can I just clarify? Are you asking for clarification from Councillor John Williams? Thank you. Councillor Williams, did you hear what Councillor... No, right. The, I think the question was, and I will come back to Councillor Bhattacharya, she was referring to pages 275 and 276 of the agenda, and Councillor Dr Bhattacharya asked, since the numbers were all in red... Did you, are you confident that you can make the savings that are implied? Okay, sorry, Councillor Bhattacharya, would you like to clarify what you asked? I just meant this question that are the volume of savings on, on page 276 realistic? Where, where are you referring the to the volume of savings, Councillor Bhattacharya? At, at which point? Okay, whole, right. whole list of there's a whole list of 275 and 276 is ended here, 276. Yes. Uh, for the previ because, uh, because previous two budgets, we have been given, uh, we have been warned that the savings will be harder and harder to come by. Or, so that's why I'm asking. Thank you. Councillor John Williams. So the question is, are you confident that you can make the savings illustrated on page 275, 276? But yeah, this this budget has been based on on a um, expecting the worst case scenario. So, therefore, the savings that we are anticipating are those that we believe we can achieve in the worst case scenario. So, yes. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. I haven't got anybody else who wishes to speak on the substantive no, motion. Oh, Councillor Heather Williams. Sorry, yes. Chair, if you permit, Councillor Richard Williams was yeah. waving for some time before oh, me. Oh, I didn't if see. You, uh, Councillor Williams back. needs to wave more obviously. Councillor uh, John, uh, Richard Williams, do go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm very innocuous, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, I had a question um, just about the increased resources that are to be allocated to planning. I see page, page 190. We've got 2.2 million. Uh, Councillor John Williams referred to that earlier. Um, and that's very welcome in principle. It's something I think we've, we've called for several times. It's good to see. Um, but could Councillor Williams clarify for us or give us more detail as to exactly what that will fund? Are we talking about more uh, officers being employed? So we'll have a net increase or uh, is a large part of that likely to go on uh, other uh, alleviated existing staff pressures, agency fees, pension deficits, etc.? So just to clarify... Councillor Richard Williams, you're talking about planning services as referred to on page 190 and increased spending, is that what it is, 2.2 million? Yep, 
Two hundred two million two hundred six thousand. Yeah, Thank you very much, Councillor John Williams. Would you like to respond? I think uh, Councillor Dr. Toomey has already um, covered this in a previous response uh, answer. But to say that um, we are in the process of um, reviewing uh, the shared planning service, um, and this is based on the. Um, transformation work that's been done in that service to now enable us to have um, sufficient uh, money to enable us to take that transformation forward. So I, I can't, you know, give every detail on that, um, but I, certainly that is the level of, of additional spending that the shared service um, planning service has asked for. Uh, to be put into the budget to enable it to complete that, um, that uh, transformation work. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, did, you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, and may I put a plea out for the minutes as well, but it has our four names as it's got very confusing between the three of us <laughs> today. Um, so, you know, I want to start with, I said earlier that some things, you know, we will always agree on and on, on certain things such as um, the, the green um, initiatives, they are to be, to be welcomed, of course, and actually on page 195, paragraph 55, the Joint Enforcement Group, I think, would actually be quite good because I know I've stood in this council and literally walked up and down those stairs between planning and environment several times before actually be able to get to a conclusion. So I'll, I'll give credit where it's due. I, I think that um, is a good thing. However, I do I obviously have the concerns about council tax chair as I've raised, and, and I would like us to look at how we're spending some of that money. So for example, we're spending 200,000 pounds on page 272 on replacing the carpets. I mean, I, I don't see any issue with the carpet in here. Um, we're spending £70,000 on redecorating. Again, is that really nece necessary to put people's council tax up for to fund? Um, I'd also say that actually there is a, there is a slight error on the, on the table on um, paragraph 28 on the page. Oh. So I'm just having to log back in because the internet's dropped out. Um, it's, thank you. That one. Thank you. Going back to paper, I'm, at least I'm trying to do paper free, Chair. Um, so it's the core spending power. Page view. We're trying to get it because it's logged me out. Okay. 189. Thank you very much, Mr. Maddox. I hope there's some money in so here somewhere. So you're talking about 189. Yes, page 189. And there's a table. You were table at 28. About. There is a slight error on the bottom right. So the SFA 2700 should be in. And the total at the bottom, I believe. But That's, that actually shows... Sorry, what, what's the error that you're saying? It's on the bottom right-hand corner. Core spending power. Yes, core spending power. Yeah, that should be 14-something because the 2,700 isn't carried down as it is on the other columns. So that's just something for members to be mindful of. Um, okay. But this, what this table shows us is actually we're looking at having more money next year from government than less. And given we're going to be getting more money from government next year, I think we ought to be reflecting that in not putting up council tax, to be quite frank. We know there are potential issues in the future and we should judge those on what happens in the future. But for now, I think you know the savings, I'm, I'm concerned about the savings, we were warned about this several years ago. Um, it's ad ad admirable that officers will make that achievement, but officers have to work within the parameters that we give them. And if we make unachievable targets, that's not going to happen. So we have to be confident that this is achievable. And I'm afraid I don't see the need to increase the council tax, given some of what we are spending the money on is carpet and decoration. And I also don't believe that the savings are potentially going to come forward and we could end up in a worse financial position. Um, and just to note, because of comments earlier, that actually the provisional figures for 2023 
are higher than 2022. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. So, Councillor John Williams, would you like to respond? And when you've responded, we'll go to the vote on this. Thank you, Chair. The, the, the point is that this is a one-off um, payment for this year. And what we need to do is that if you don't have the income from council tax this year, that then carries forward into the following years because we have a limit of five pounds which uh, we have applied and next year we will still have a limit of five pounds. So we will be short of the money that we have raised this year even though we have covered it by other means. So you will still need to find that money in successive years and you haven't done that in your amended budget. Have you, is that, you're finished, have you, Councillor Williams? Thank you very much. Okay, so I shall, we're going to a vote then on the original motion, which is on page 183 and 184 of our agenda. This is recommendation 2A through 2L. And I'm going to take them all as one. So, members, if you wish to vote for that, uh, you press the green button. And if you wish to vote against that, you press the red button. Can members remind me how many people we are in the room? I think we've got one person who has not yet voted. 28. Good. Okay, so that's 18 for and 10 against. So that uh, recommendation is carried. Thank you. Right, okay, so next item on the agenda is council tax resolution, which was sent to us as a supplement on the 15th of February. This is item nine on the agenda. Members, the council tax resolution and the accompanying report were circulated as a supplement to all members of the council on the 15th of February. May I call on Councillor John Williams, the lead cabinet member for finance, to move the recommendation in the report. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. Well, finally, for me, following approval of the HRA and general fund budgets, I ask that you approve the council tax resolution for 2022-23. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody wish to speak on this? Oh, sorry, do you have a seconder? Councillor Bill Handley, thank you. So, does anybody wish to speak on this? I can't see any hands, so we might very swiftly go to ask if you would like to accept this by affirmation. No? no? I think I don't. We need to take a recorded vote. Sorry. Okay, sorry, we need to take a recorded vote. That's fine, sorry. So, uh, those members who wish to vote for the council tax resolution, press the blue button and green. Those who wish to vote against, press the blue button and then red. And if you wish to abstain, same, but press yellow. Uh, and I've noted that Councillor Clayton has left the room, so we're going to be fewer numbers than before. Okay, so of the 27 people in the room, we've got 18 voting for and nine voting against. Thank you, members. So that vote is carried. Thank you very much. Which brings us to item 10, the Swavesey by raise rate for the year 2022-23, and that's on pages 289 and 294 in our agenda. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins, I invite you to move the recommendation from the Swavesey Byways Committee. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, it's very simple. The uh, Byways um, charging group advisory group men met uh, a few weeks ago and decided to keep the uh, rates charged at one pound 20 per hectare um, for those who are charge payers this is the same rate as was last year 
uh, they've had some money given to them by BA14, which is still being used. So I just recommend that we accept this and we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Brian Milnes, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Okay. Do you wish to... Uh, I know we have one other speaker, so do you wish to wait? Oh, I'll wait then. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Ellington. Thank you, Chairman. I think this is a really good news story, and we need some good news stories around here. Two years ago, those of you who were here will remember that I reported significant problems with the Byways Act in many ways. The farmers who were volunteering to keep the byways repaired with their equipment and their manpower were getting older and fewer, and uh, many of the byways were being um, built on by residents and they didn't come under the um, levy to pay for the roads, but used it more than anybody else. As a result, I undertook a survey of the byways. I walked the nine miles, it was very good for my waistline, and um, took a record of uh, all the state of it, each byway, took pictures and wrote a report. This um, went to the committee, but it also helped us to persuade the parish council to support my idea for asking for machinery to repair the uh, byway rather than asking contractors to come in and repair the byway. Um, we, uh, and that the money was offered to us, um, well, it was offered to the parish council from the A14 levy fund. Um, the parish council agreed that we should use the money that way and uh, with agreement and help, I have to say, significant help from South Cam's drainage officer and um, support from the, the um, uh, leader, the um, lead member, it was agreed that the gra grader should be bought. It's taken a little while to get it, but we got it last month. They attached it to a rather large tractor. They um, used it on one or two of the byways with lots of people watching. The RSPB are very interested. Can we borrow it? Only if you pay us. Um, and it, the parish council have agreed to um, look after it and ensure it because it has to be owned by an organization. Um, the 20, uh, one, nearly 22,000 pounds, we only used 18 of it on the grader. The rest of the money has been put into a special parish council um, account to be used for maintaining it. People are Professor being Emerson, trained to would use you like it. To wind, we, wind up, would you like to wind up? Yeah. We don't need so many planings because you're taking them from the high spots and putting them in the low spots. The roads look lovely and everybody's happy. Hurrah, wonderful. Thank you very much, that's lovely. So uh, can I just suggest, uh, I don't think we've got any other speakers, so Councillor Brian Mills, would you like to respond? <laughs> I'd just like to thank uh, Sue for the uh, story and her support in uh, looking after this way, by the way. Thank you. Great. I move Thank to vote. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Ellington, would you like to turn your microphone off? Oh. Thank you. Splendid. So, uh, those people in favour of that? Oh, did, did, can we take this by affirmation? Yeah. Hurrah. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, does anybody wish to vote against? Or abstain? Okay, so that's unanimous by affirmation. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is 11, the calendar of meetings for the year 2022-23 you're invited to approve the calendar of meetings and i move the recommendation and uh do i have a seconder yes i'm prepared to second thank you councillor judith Ripith. uh does anybody wish to discuss this in any way no agreed, agreed by affirmation lovely thank you very much does any wish anybody wish to uh, object or abstain no 
So it's by affirmation. Thank you very much. Item 12, uh, on page 301 of our agenda, uh, we're invited to note the report. Does anybody wish to ask any questions or speak? Unfortunately, the updates get shorter I think, each time now. Um, but given the change of priorities um, on the Oscar mark, um, could we now know what it is that the leader is vision is, as to quote Councillor Wright, and what is being represented at these meetings over the last few years? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think um, you know, the paper makes it quite clear that. Um, you know, as far as, um, as far as we're concerned, the arc, the arc is no more. And in fact, the confirmation, I've, had, I've heard nothing official from um, government ministers that the arc is dead. However, I was in a meeting with um, the MP for Central Bedfordshire, uh, Richard Fuller, uh, last week, and uh, with, with some parish councillors talking about cycleways. And one of the um, parish councillors there asked him about the Oxford Cambridge Arc, and he said, um, I asked Mr. Gove about this, and then he made a gesture, which I won't, won't show you in a council meeting, which implied that it had been, it had been flushed away somewhere. Um, so that was from that MP. I've heard nothing else uh, from the MP other than that. So, you know, as far as the levelling up white paper made it quite clear that there was to be, um, prob well, probably no further significant government in, uh, investment in the Oxford, Cambridge, London triangle. So I'm afraid, Councillor Williams, I really know no more than any, anyone else, really, at this stage of the game. So there is no vision, because I'm not sure there is, a, there is an arc as things stand at the moment, and I think the, uh, the paper made that quite clear. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, did you want to... Uh, Ask a further question. Thank you. Um, so, based a supplementary question, then leader through yourself, chair. Um, does this mean that it's this council's intention to withdraw from this group if it's no longer required, or are you are you looking to continue with the project um, without the government, as the report suggests, as an option? Uh, so, at the last meeting of um, the last plenary meeting of the uh, all the council leaders across the arc. They agreed to uh, continue funding the funding the the staff that support the councils for the next six months, in the hope that it will become apparent uh, what government's government's views are. You know, until we're clear on government's views, then I don't I don't know is the answer. Um, you know, it was a government it was a government project. We need complete cl you know clarification that it no longer is. I mean, I might ask. Um, Liz Watts to come in because she has some. <laughs> You're not getting away with it. Uh, she has she has involvement at, at officer officer level, but I don't think knows any more than than I do. So so we don't know what the future holds. Thank you. Perhaps Liz Watts could throw some light on this. Through you, Chair, I have nothing more to add. I'm afraid, but uh, uh, Councillor Smith has, has really kind of told you this, the picture as it is. Thank you. In which case, I, we are just... Um, Councillor Cohn, did you wish to ask something? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was just going to um, follow up on what Councillor Smith had um, asked uh, or told us about um, us keeping provision for the next six months. Uh, are, are we, as South Cambridgeshire District Council, paying into that, or is that a different... How is that funding coming about? So, oh, now let me think. We could, we could, yeah, Liz, do you want to, you know about the funding. So, Liz Watts, go ahead. Through you, Chair. Um, we do pay, all districts pay a membership fee. Um, I can't off the top of my head tell you what it is, Councillor Cohn, but we would be expected to pay six months as all, all districts and counties and so on are still involved. Thank you. Uh, so, no further questions. We are invited to note the report, and I think we've commented and noted. Thank you. So, item 13, uh, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority members, I invite the Council to note the reports on the work of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority as outlined in the circulated papers. 
and ask the Council's representatives on the combined authority to comment if they wish to do so. So uh, our representatives are Councillors Bridget Smith uh, on the combined authority board, uh, Judith Ripith and Adrian van der Veer on the um, overview and scrutiny committee, and Councillor Tony Mason on the audit and governance committee. Do any members have any comments? I've got nothing to add over and above what's in the paper. Um, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, and anything from anybody online? No. Okay, thank you. So, members, we've noted the reports uh, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you very much. So, that's on to item 14, the Greater Cambridge Partnership. We'll now consider the item summarising the recent business of the Greater Cambridge Partnership. May I invite the Council to note the decision summary of the meeting of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Executive Board at its meeting on the 9th of December 2021. Thank you. Okay, right. So item 15 on our agenda, we takes us back to um, uh, Lipple. Um, where is it? Yes, here we are. It's the supplement that we received on the 18th of February, which, of course, I can't find. I expect my vice chair has got one. Thank you very much. Uh, so, members, your attention is drawn to the leader's proposal that Councillor Peter Fane be endorsed as chair of the planning committee. Leader, do you wish to speak? Leader, do you wish to speak? Distracted here. So this is, uh, we're talking about the proposal that Councillor Peter Fane be endorsed as chair of the planning committee. Uh, yes, thank you very much. My, apolo my apologies. It's turning into one of those days of um, plate spinning with people being ill and goodness knows what else. Um, yes, I would like to propose that uh, Councillor Peter Fane uh, be, um, be approved as the chair of the planning committee um, as of now, please. Thank you very much. And we have a wonderful picture of him on our screen. So, Thank you. Councillor, uh, do you have a seconder? I believe that's Councillor Tooney Hawkins, Dr. Tooney Hawkins. Thank you. Do you wish to say anything now? Or? Uh, no, just to um, step on the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any alternatives to the Chair of Planning Committee? No. Okay, lovely. So I'm going to take that by affirmation. Lovely. Does anybody wish to vote against or uh, abstain. Oh, silence. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, group leaders, do any group leaders wish to notify the council of any other changes in any bodies? So, we don't have Labour. Do you have any other? No. So, none from Conservative and none from Labour. Thank you. So, members, you're asked to note and endorse those changes in memberships and roles, and I think they're duly noted. Thank you. Item 16 on the agenda is uh, an urgent executive decision, which is on page 339 and pages following. <clears throat> Members, we are invited to note an urgent executive decision. And uh, I think we do. Thank you. Okay. Right so. Uh, so the next part of the agenda, members, would be questions from councillors. Does anybody want to pause before we go into this, or should we go straight into it? Pause for uh, five minutes. Oh, yes, and also, could we... Right, okay. So, if you want five minutes, we'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit longer. Um, we're at 17.38, so I'll say quarter two. 17.45. Thank you. Please be back here by then.
Um, so I just want to clarify at the beginning, when we uh, were registering apologies for absence, I just wanted to confirm that we did say that Councillor Ian Solemn had given his apologies. Yeah, good. Okay, lovely. So, uh, right, members, you are reminded we are dealing with item 17, which is on um, pages little v11 on our agenda. We have a third period of 30 minutes for the entire item. And the 30 minutes includes those questions where notice has been provided as set out in the agenda. And if there's still time remaining after those questions with notice have been dealt with, we will deal with any questions which have been notified to Democratic Services Manager before the start of this meeting. Can I just ask if there were any? No, there are no further. Okay. So, uh, I will in invite councillors to ask their questions in the following order. So, A, Councillor Judith Ripith, would you like to ask your question? Thank you. As read. Thank you. And I believe um, the leader will be responding to that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chair. I mean, normally um, Councillor Macdonald would answer this, but obviously he's, uh, he's had to leave. Um, so thank you very much indeed for your, your question, Councillor Ripworth. Um, so as a council, we've been able to provide significant discretionary funding to local businesses since the onset of the pandemic. And this discretionary funding has come in the form of additional restrictions grants, um, government grants and the, from the government grant scheme. Our ARG payout totaled £4,667,646 from April 2020 to the end of June 21. And this also included our hardship scheme, which was a unique scheme that we devised to specially focus on those businesses which had been ineligible or unable to receive grants elsewhere. Funds were paid out over 1,600 businesses, largely operating in the supply chain to retail, leisure and hospitality businesses affected during that time. So between June and October 21, we paid out a further 1,377,000 uh, from a top-up ARG fund received. And I think we got that because we performed well. Um, and we called this our growth grant payment. And that was made to an additional 202 businesses and again, specifically businesses who are looking to launch, to scale or grow in our, dis our district. So we're currently administrating the final tranche of Omicron ARG funding uh, received from central government in January 2022, to date paying out 152,000 out of a total 354,628 pounds. And that allocation has gone to 48 businesses. We expect to have made full use of the funds by the end of March, and this final tranche of funding is being allocated to those businesses who've been able to provide demonstrable evidence of sales and revenue losses as a result of the Omicron wave specifically. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Did you have a supplementary, Councillor Ruffes? Yes, I do. Um, what has been the business feedback? Thank you, that's a really nice question. So, um, we know that this funding has for many, many businesses been a complete lifeline during the last two years when businesses have really, really suffered. Um, so some of the quotes we've had um, include, I honestly can't express how grateful we are for this. It means the absolute world to us that we can push forward with our bed and breakfast project and get it completed. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, lots of, lots of lovely examples of people being incredibly grateful and uh, I think we've uh, yeah, I think we've allocated the money speedily and effectively. Thank you Councillor Smith. Um, Councillor Sue Ellington. Thank you, you Chairman. Like uh, as on the order of order papers. And so this was how long would it take for a planning application to come to committee. Thank you. So Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins I believe you might be responding. Uh, thank you Chair and uh, through you um, I hope this answers the question because I wasn't sure the, how much extra, extra in addition to what. So here goes. Um, of course, because the nature and type of each planning committee decision varies, what we've tried to do in answering this question is look at the costs 
of this specific meeting. We chose the 9th of February, which is the most recent, um, which was a meeting that considered three applications, an enforcement report, and two four hours and 55 minutes in total. So we run that up to five hours. Now, of course, the cost of a meeting is determined by the number of fixed costs, such as allowances paid to uh, the members who are receiving um, allowances, um, costs from you know, officers within the council, outside the council and the county, uh, democratic services, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it includes the time spent preparing for the meeting, at the meeting, and the follow-up <laughs> after the meeting. Um, now, while specific inquiries have taken place about this most recent meeting, um, what we've also tried to do is try to check the conclusions on officer hours for this meeting um, by referring to the time recording system that exists now that officers use. Now, uh, from the published hourly rates, the cost for this particular meeting across all those services was a figure of 7,892 pounds. That's for those five hours. Now, of course, if you round that up um, to the per hour cost, that comes to 1,578 pounds per hour. And of course, don't forget, it was just three planning applications and an enforcement report. So clearly, um, it depends on how big or complex um, or involved an item is that will dictate the amount of committee time um, that takes to reach uh, a specific decision. And just to clarify, this particular meeting, I think you were there. <laughs> um, uh, the number of the specialist officers we had was limited. We have had more in previous. Um, so a great number of officers attending for all or part of the meeting, um, you know, for things like conservation, landscape, urban design, would increase the cost beyond this figure. Um, and just to say, the service doesn't have any data on the specific time by each officer on each application before, um, during, and after the meeting. So, hope that helps to answer the question, but I wasn't sure whether you know, it's extra on top of what. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Councillor Ellington, did you have a supplementary? Thank you, yes. Thank you for taking the time to think that through. I suppose I really am concerned. My question is really a follow-up to the November Council meeting um, which members can find on page 10 in minutes, when I asked about the council's enforcement policy. I followed that question with the lead member out of the meeting um, um, and was informed that even though the application had been refused by the planning committee, uh, it, it was decided that to enforce the decision would not be cost effective. And to an extent, I, I have to say that I could understand where exactly the lead member was coming from. And my follow-up question is, therefore, if it costs about £1,500 to bring an application to the committee, has the council a cost-risk-benefit enforcement policy in place to ensure that money and reputation is not wasted. Does that all make sense? Thank you, Councillor Ellington. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Um, thank you. And through you, Lee, then, I don't have a cost for enforcement that I can give you now, but bear in mind, I said earlier on today that we are going through a transformation project for the enforcement uh, process. And no doubt that we will be able to 
potentially put something together on a cost for enforcement once we've worked through the system and made it more efficient. So, happy to answer that question, perhaps further down the line, when we've done the transformation project. Thank you. Um, can I just say thank you for that? Good. And I think it's thank something we need to work on. Thank you very much. I also just wanted to note um, that Councillor Aidan van der Veer joined us just before the questions. Uh, I think you weren't here before. Were you here before? Sorry? Four o'clock. Okay, you came at four. Lovely. Great. Okay. It's just, just so that it's recorded. Uh, that's okay. Uh, there is, at this point, we go on to question C. As on the order paper, Chair. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, so, Councillor John Williams, did you want to respond to Councillor Heather Williams' question? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, when we were elected in 2018, those who voted for us expected us to look critically at all aspects of the Council's functioning, including the composition of the senior leadership team. Councillor Williams will be aware of the Council's legal obligations to ensure fair severance payments and to treat those employees who were displaced by restructuring with fairness and respect. To answer the question, the expenditure on separation agreements and redundancy payments was 300,000 in 2018-19, 109,000 in 2019-20, 48,000 in 2020-21, and 92,000 in 21-22. And the restructuring of the senior leadership team accounts for some, but not all of these amounts. The restructuring of the senior team has streamlined the organization and delivered greater efficiency. Our willingness to tackle this problem and create the right organizational structure is now delivering results with an ongoing saving to the council of 230,000 each year. Just one moment. Councillor John Williams, do you accept the point of order? <laughs> what is your point of order? Point of order for yourself, Chair, is 12.78, direct oral answer. I've had the answer. Um, anything else is just churning up time. Councillor John Williams, would you like to finish what you're saying? Um, Yes, okay, if you're asking me to finish, yeah. We now have a professional and well-run organisation with the ability, capability to deliver an ambitious business plan and it has demonstrated enormous resilience and flexibility as demonstrated by the brilliant response to the challenges of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Did you have a supplementary, Councillor Heather Williams? Uh, yes. Does the sort of, doing some rough calculations, we're about half a million, does that fit with the value for money strategy, just using that money to get rid of staff? Yes or no question, Chair? Sorry, it's up to the member to answer how he wishes. Thank you. Yes, it's not as plain as uh, yes or no. As I explained, um, we need to treat our colleagues, our business, our, our council colleagues with, um, with respect and with the... Um, uh, with fairness and respect and with um, the, the um, fair severance payments. So it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of what, um, what those um, former colleagues um, were entitled to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on to Councillor Graham Cohn. Your question is 17D, relating to the cost of new furniture. Uh, thank you, Chair, just on, on the order paper. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Neil Goff, are you able to respond? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. So work, work practices have changed dramatically over the past 18 months, and the Council is adapting to new hybrid ways of working and collaborating. In particular, we're providing space for the sort of impromptu collaboration that is now needed for staff in the office to work efficiently. These improvements also facilitate the use of new and emerging technology and are now different teams to work more closely on cross-functional projects. The figure spent on furniture fixtures and fittings in the last 18 months is £46,622, which includes not just the replacement of broken furniture, 
but also upgrades required for developing those more collaborative workspaces and buying furniture to meet the needs of people with disabilities through the access to work scheme, something I'm sure all members would support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. I note that Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya is leaving. Um, Councillor Cohn, did you have a supplementary? Uh, yeah, um, I was just going to say, is it possible to split those figures up between um, disability access and what has just been uh, new furnishings in the council? Councillor Goff. I don't know the answer to that question, uh, Councillor Cohn, but if we can, we will give you a written response to do so. Thank you. Okay, so Thanks very much. Councillor Bunty Waters, your question. Thank you, Chair, as on the agenda paper. Thank you very much. Uh, and this relates to refurbishment of the council, the members' lounge. Councillor Goff, are you still there? Yep, yeah, sorry. sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters, for your question. So, the refurbishment of the members' lounge and the updating of the office equipment and furniture were part of the planned overhaul of South Cairns Hall, which included replacement of the fire alarm system, flooring, overhead lighting, and the repair of structural damage sustained in a previous storm. The original members' lounge was installed over 18 years ago and needed refurbishment to meet health and safety standards to replace furniture that was worn out and also to enable hybrid meetings to be undertaken. The room also now provides the four workstations for members. The upgrade to this work was to this room was first proposed by the former independent member and chair of the council, Council Douglas De Lacey, who was very concerned about the poor state and unsuitability of the room. In his words, it was not a nice place to work. Increasingly, a number of new members wanted a place to work in the building, and the room was certainly not suitable for working in. The lounge, now known as the corporate lounge, can be used by both members and officers alike, ensuring that increased use will be made of the improved facilities. The cost of this refurbishment amounted to £12,396, which included painting and redecorating, replacing the floor, flooring and replacement of the furniture. Um, where is this money from, this 12, nearly 13k from? Where would this be from? Is there a special budget for it? I don't think there was a special budget, but I think it was part and parcel of the general refurbishment to the building, but maybe one of the officers would clarify that for me. Thank you very much. I, I was just meaning the whole overall uh, costing of that. Councillor Waters, Councillor, uh, Peter Maddock is, I think, going to respond. Yeah, so this would just be part of the normal budget we'd have under our office accommodation budget. Our office accommodation budget for Ken. Office accommodation budget we hold. Thank you very much. So moving on, uh, question F from Councillor Ruth Betson. Thank you, Chair. Um, as on the papers. Thank you. And this relates to costs on agency staff and management consultants. Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's good management to use short-term resources to bring in skills and to fill temporary gaps to ensure that the council is able to discharge its responsibilities. Gone are the days when any organisation has all of the capabilities it needs internally. Similarly, given the hiring colleague changes, challenges we face in some key areas, agency and temporary contract staff that be needed to maintain services. All this is part and parcel of running a large organisation. To give more detail, I will break down some of the numbers. Consultants are often used to bring in skills and specific expertise that the council does not possess and for which it, should be, it would be uneconomic to create permanent roles, for example, short-term projects. It is useful to further break down the expenditure on consultants within the shared services of waste and planning. In the waste area, the spending on consultants was 23,872 in 2018-19, 62,009 pounds in 2019-20, 29,031 pounds in 
and £10,684 in 21-22. In the planning service, the spending was £620,700 in 2018-19, £899,971 in 2019-20, £566,396 in 2021, and £318,724 in 21-22. Of the amount spent on consultants in the planning area, a significant amount over the period was driven by the need for technical input and support to the local plan, area action plans and SPDs. Consultants were also employed in support of specialist areas such as neighbourhood plans. In other areas of the council activities, the spend was 202,569 in 2018-19, 505,779 in 2019-20, 366,111 in 2021-239,647 in 2021-22. Of these amounts, approximately 231,000 was spent on transformation, which of course is delivered and will continue to deliver very significant ongoing savings. Overall, the average annual spend on consultants is at the same level as this council spent in 2017-18, the last year of the previous administration. Turning to agency fees, agency staff are often retained to fill budget roles where it proves to be difficult to attract permanent staff. This has been the case in planning and over some of the time in the waste services. Agency staff are also hired for short-term requirements where permanent staff are unavailable for example sick or on leave and the service needs to be maintained. I would again break the figures down by the main shared service areas and other council areas. In the waste area, the spending on agency staff was £303,084 in 2018-19, £1,787 in 2019-20, £344,250 in 2020-21, and £284,876 in 21-22. In the planning service, the spending was £431,346 in 2018-19, one million four hundred and twenty two thousand two hundred and fifty five in twenty nineteen twenty one million two thousand two hundred and seventy four in twenty 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 one and five hundred and three thousand eight hundred and nineteen in twenty one twenty two as I mentioned in both of these areas, the challenge of hiring staff was considerable over this period and was essential in order to retain service levels for which the council is responsible. In 21-22, our total expenditure on agency staff was approximately 7% of the total payroll cost of the council. The spend in absolute terms about as if the, the spend was in absolute terms about as was incurred in the last year of the Conservative administration. But when adjusting for COVID-related agency costs, in 21-22, agency costs were over £100,000 lower than in the last year of the previous administration. Thank you. Yes, Sorry, thank you, Chair. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Jackson? Yes, sir. thank you, Chair. And I, I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, Councillor John Williams for the uh, detail there. Um, I don't know if Democratic Services will be uh, registering all of that in the minutes. I doubt it. Is it possible to have the detail in writing? I appreciate that thank you I did start trying to write it down <laughs> couldn't follow um, my question my supplementary is um, does a through you chair does the lead member uh, feel that any of that uh, money could have been used elsewhere I'm at the member for Camborne and I, I'm desperate to give Camborne its high street couldn't some of that management fee uh, be spent on that. The, the um, consultants and agents um, could have perhaps been working on Camborne High Street. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John Williams. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, as I explained, I, this, this, we, only need, we only employ agency and, and uh, you know, temporary staff when we absolutely have to. And the difficulty we have in South Cams that we are in an area of 
virtually full employment. We have less than 3% unemployment in the Greater Cambridge area. And we have um, prices that are similar to those in London. And it's extremely difficult to attract staff to come here because we can't give London waiting, even though the costs here are very similar to those in London. So it's extremely difficult to recruit very experienced staff. And therefore, we have to go out and hire those staff you know, as consultants and agency staff to enable us to deliver the services that our residents expect. I would love to be able to fill all these posts by, with permanent staff, but it's just not possible. Thank you, Councillor Williams. So moving on, uh, Councillor Richard Williams, you are at 17G about the trees. Thank you very much, Chair. My question is as on the agenda. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins, I believe you're responding to this one. And I apologise, it's about tree offices, not tree. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, through, uh, through you. The shared planning service employs uh, tree offices only for South Cam's area. And it has a different arrangement for uh, Cambridge City. So there are currently two um, officer posts. Um, for three officers. Um, one is permanent. Well, both should be permanent, but we have somebody in one. Uh, the other one became vacant following the departure of the officer that you are well aware of. However, this vacant post is currently filled by an agency worker um, who works part-time, as well as a tree person from Cambridge City. So that vacant post is actually covered full time. Um, and we are currently in a recruitment process for a permanent officer in that place. Um, just to let you know that adverts that we've put out to fill that post with a permanent member of staff have not so far <laughs> resulted in any successful um, appointment. So we are reviewing the strategy, and I think this is where we need to put a, a supplement on the, um, on the offer that we're making, uh, because there is a national shortage um, of suitable specialists. So hope that helps. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Richard Williams, did you want to have a supplementary? Yes, please, Chair, a very quick one. Um, uh, thank the member for that. I asked a similar question back in May. I we're not really any further forward than we were last May. In fact, we're, we're a tiny little bit back. I'm pleased the post is being covered. Um, but some of that 2.2 million, could I make the case again that we allocate some of that in this area and do what we need? I mean, I do have trees officers, parish level trees officers, volunteers in my patch who are on the verge of resigning because they feel everything they do um, is ignored by the council. Now, that is not a criticism of officers at all. They have a very heavy workload. I think as we talked about last May, you know, for a thousand cases they have to look at. We do need more manpower in this um, area. So can I please make the case again that, as I say, part of that 2.2 million, we look at allocating more to this area. Thank you. Councillor Dr Hawkins, did you want to respond to that? Uh, thank you. I, I refuse to accept that we are in a worse position especially because we had the post filled, uh, even though there were temporary staff. Um, my suggestion to you actually will be on what you have just mentioned regarding the tree people in your patch. Why don't they come and talk to me? I just want to understand what the issues are. If they are saying that they're not being responded to, then perhaps they need to let me know how we can look at that. However, yes, we are seriously looking for someone to take that uh, vacant position. And again, don't forget, we're going through a transformation project here. We're looking at exactly what we're doing in terms of the various types of services we offer. And we will, we need to um, increase the, uh, the, the service for the people providing the service. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Timmy Hawkins. We've just got a couple of minutes left for the last question. I will have to call the halt at 20 past. So, Councillor, uh, the question um, being asked by Councillor Nick Wright, um, 
who is online. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Wright. As written, Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. Uh, thank you. I will be quick. Um, the total value of planning application fees associated with applications in the CDC, uh, for which the 2012 regulations allow a refund because of the age, is 300 and 400, 393,000. <sighs> Hope that makes sense. 300,493,000. Um, the majority of this figure actually is about 268,000 of that comprises fees from major applications, 24 of those, um, and 15 of which are between 6 and 12 months old, so for major applications. There are 12 applications for household development, um, which come to a potential figure of 2,116, okay? And actually, the largest number of applications in that um, relate to discharge of conditions. And that just represents 10,910 in planning fees. But for completeness, those are at risk. So the 300,000 is at risk. We've only, ever, we've only paid out 9,492 on 17 applications, just for comparison. Sorry, members, we must halt there. That's the, we've had the 30 minutes for questions and answers. So I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Wright, you don't get to ask your supplementary. I do apologise, but I, can yeah. I, at this I point, point, point to Chair, we've sat through some very waffly answers using up the time. And Councillor you know, Wright, I have done my very best to keep members to time. Um, thank you for your points. I'm sorry, that's just the way it goes. Thank you. Um, I wanted at this point to say... Um, Thank you very much to John Williams, Council John Williams, for all the answers he has given up to now, including those in questions. Right, notices of motion. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, we don't have to do it until 6.30, but I'm going to do it now, and that is to ask that we have permission to go on over the four hours. Can I just see if members are happy? <laughs> Okay, happy would be an overstatement. Prepared to continue. Thank you. Does anybody object? Uh, I, yes, I might need a seconder. Perhaps the vice chair would kindly second. Yes, I kindly second. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Good. Okay, so we can continue after 6.30. Thank you very much. And, and members agree that by affirmation. Yes? Lovely. Thank you very much. So, moving on to notices of motion. Uh, this starts on, well, they're on, starting right at the very bottom of page uh, little Roman 7 in the beginning of the agenda. Um, we are reminded that a maximum of 30 minutes is allowed for each motion to be moved, seconded and debated including dealing with any amendments. At the expiry of the 30 minute period, debate will cease immediately and the mover of the original motion, or if the original motion has been amended, the mover of that amendment, now forming a substantive motion, will have the right of reply before the motion or the amendment is put to the vote. Um, and for the purposes of voting numbers, I just wanted to record that both Councillor Bhattacharya and Councillor Waters left during questions. So, uh, and I just would like to remind you, proposer speeches may not exceed five minutes and other speeches may not exceed three minutes. So I'm going to try and be quite strict about that. Uh, so we first look at the motion from Councillor Richard Williams on page Roman 8. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, would you like to move your motion? Thank you very much, Chair, and I promise not to treat that five minutes as a target. I will treat it as a limit, and I hope this won't be controversial and that we can move through it reasonably quickly. Um, just to give members an idea of the background of uh, my motion. Uh, my motion um, grew out of something that occurred in one of my parish councils, where um, a resident raised the uh, question of um, the council's biodiversity policy and, it, and its legal obligations. Um, and 
the resident who raised the concern was, was, was in fact quite right, that parish councils are under a legal obligation under the uh, Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act to uh, take account of biodiversity um, in, in carrying out their functions in, in so far as it's compatible with other um, obligations on the parish council. Now, the first place a parish council tends to look when it's looking for guidance as to how to uh, meet a policy like that or a legal requirement like that is to South Camps. Unfortunately, there was nothing really available from South Camps in terms of guidance. Now, we have lots of good initiatives about biodiversity, and I want to keep this on a cross-party basis if I can and acknowledge that with our SPD, um, and, and, you know, obviously it, it fits in with the, with the Environment Act um, as well. But there was a gap, essentially, was the point I, I, I want to make in terms of the specific guidance that parish councils could benefit from in terms of how they might... Uh, meet their obligations, particularly in terms of adopting um, a biodiversity policy um, so that they can be clear and transparent about how they do fulfil their legal obligations. Now, there is, there's a lot of good material out there. Um, Natural Cambridgeshire has, for example, a toolkit um, called their Nature Recovery Toolkit, which includes a lot of the same uh, sort of information that we need, but that is obviously not... Um, directed specifically towards um, parish um, councils. Now, I know subsequently um, some information has been, been put on our website, but, but um, following the publication of the, the, the motion, I have in fact been in touch with Natural Cambridgeshire um, and an officer of the association um, who've agreed that there is a, a gap in the sort of guidance that we could provide specifically tailored towards parish councils. Um, there are some good examples of that. Leicestershire, for example, has got a very good short toolkit, easy to understand um, for parish councils. Um, and similarly, Devon as well has got quite a good toolkit that they use. So what I'm hoping really is that we can work with um, partners like Natural Cambridgeshire um, and we can develop a similar sort of toolkit uh, to enable our parish councils to be able to um, have some guidance about how they might best discharge um, their obligations. As I say, that work is in a sense already underway um, through, the, through the conversation I've already had with with Natural Cambridgeshire, one of our officers um, has been involved in, in that as well. Um, so I very much hope that we could, by adopting this motion, just help to plug this small gap in the chain um, that, that uh, I think has come to light. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Is that seconded? Uh, yes. Oh, thank you, Councillor Khan. Uh, so do you wish to reserve your right to speak, Talia? So, open for debate, members. Councillor Bridget Smith. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, Councillor Williams, thank, thank you for this. Um, but I'm surprised that you seem to be quite unaware of all the work we've actually been doing uh, with our parishes and community groups over the past four years to support and encourage them on their race both to zero carbon and as they strive to do their bit to preserve, enhance and protect their own natural environment. Um, if you'd been at last night's launch of this year's climate and environment fortnight, um, you would have met representatives from quite a few parish councils throughout the district. And you'd also have heard from the um, a brilliant presentation from um, Annie Sander, who's the head of Cambridge Carbon Footprint. Um, and they've put together, with our sponsorship, a fantastic online resource, um, and which, he, which I think is 16 hours of training for community groups on, it's kind of the whole package, how you recruit volunteers, how you keep your volunteers, um, you know, motivated, great big uh, sort of menu of things you can, things you can do and how you can succeed. So um, a quick glance at our own website links to um, the Zero Carbon Grants and the Community Chest Biodiversity Grants, which uh, you know, are, are fairly new. And actually it has a link to this um, eight part Net Zero Now online training pack. So the fact that we've sponsored that through the Zero Carbon Grants program, you know, it means that we are also promoting it to all our parish councils. So additionally, our planning and natural environment team are talking to parish councils about biodiversity, about the SPD in particular, at the next parish forum, um, about how they can, uh, they can uh, implement it themselves. And you've already referenced Natural Cambridgeshire. 
um, and, their, and their toolkit, which we already promote. So I think we need to be really careful about um, reinventing the wheel and du duplicating work when actually there's really good stuff that we've sponsored. But also, you know, we work really closely with Natural Cambridgeshire, and I think... I think Councillor Pippa Haylings actually sits on their board, and I certainly go and speak to their forums very regularly. Um, so finally, as you know, government's mandated um, that nature recovery plans are created across the country, and um, I believe that Natural Cambridge are going to be working with the county council as the, uh, the lead, um, lead authority on the nature recovery plan, and I think that's going to uh, probably include audits of the national the natural assets. So I'm really struggling, even though I'm happy to support this because it's, it's all good stuff, um, but I'm slightly struggling to see clearly what's being asked for over and above what we are actually already doing, um, either ourselves or with our partners or by our sponsorship of um, other bodies within the, within the field. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Uh, and I believe Councillor Tuma Hawkins would like to respond. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Leader. I'm actually quite surprised um, to hear that um, Councillor Richard Williams thinks that there isn't much available. Um, I mean, obviously, protecting and enhancing biodiversity um, is greatly important to residents. And you may recall, actually, that biodiversity and open spaces is one of the seven key things of the Emerging Local Plan. So it's quite important. Um, and we, we introduced this thing back in 2019 at the start of the plan making process and um, you know, put it to residents in the first conversation that we had back in 2020. And they told us it was a high priority for them. So it, it shows we are actually well ahead <laughs> um, of many organizations and the government in our thinking about biodiversity. Now, the other thing we did as part of the, uh, the work um, ongoing is our Dublin Nature Strategy. I think you might remember that we have one, which we adopted on the 3rd of February 2021. And this strategy does provide guidance for parish and town councils. And I think if you look on pages 26, 27 of that Dublin Nature Strategy, you will see <laughs> what we are offering. Um, and includes what zero carbon communities grant scheme, uh, the climate and environment workshops, the pre wardens network. Uh, you know, we even had the planting of free trees. We had three free trees, which led up to six free trees, which we offered to um, all parishes, um, and also neighbourhood planning uh, for nature. So there's a lot that we are actually providing in terms of guidance in that document. And I would suggest that um, you know, we all actually talk to our parishes um, and encourage them to take up and have a look at uh, this document. Um, and the other thing is that the uh, communities team, as far as I know, have been talking to, as you mentioned, um, natural, um, uh, natural Cambridgeshire and they are talking to them about how that toolkit, which you mentioned, actually could be expanded and used right, to make things better. So there's no point reinventing the wheel, so to speak. That toolkit could be used by our, um, our parishes. Um, so all I'm saying is, you know, we are doing a lot at the moment. Um, in fact, the other thing I would say is please Tell your parishes, encourage them to actually attend the um, area team meetings that we have for parishes. We had the first one for area one parish councils yesterday, I think it was. And I was, there was some attendance, but there could have been a lot more. And I think the, the, we had... Sorry, Councillor Dr. Hall. Yeah, I'm, we I'm sorry to Dr. Williams. About we, no, I'm sorry. We must stop SPD. now. Thank you. So it's 30 minutes. Get them to attend. 30 minutes for the whole discussion and debate and answers. So I'm afraid we'll stop there. And although other people had registered to speak, uh, they won't be able to. Thank you. Um, we need to go to the boat. Actually, we should have gone to each speaker. Yeah, there were. That was for the speaker. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I thought it seemed a bit quick. <laughs> 
Sorry, I do apologise. That was just for Councillor Hawkins. I do apologise. There are other speakers who wish to speak. So, Councillor Brian Mills. That's fine. Thank you. He's, okay, you're withdrawing, are you? Okay. And then Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I've just looking at the wording of the motion, which is what we're voting on, you know, this seems like a very sensible, pragmatic thing to do. Um, and I think that it's a gap has been identified and this can help fill it. I, I, I agree, it should not be controversial and we'll be fully supporting this. Um, I would also say in response, Chair, to, to the issues around people coming to the um, forums, I have raised previously that actually for some of the smaller parishes, coming into those forums is, they've not had always, they find it quite intimidating. I've found we've had better results if you go on size rather than geographical area. Um, I had a parish council report to me that they came to a, a planning meeting, but people were talking about bigger developments and things that were going on. So they almost felt like they, they didn't really have a, a place or a right to moan, where actually it does matter. Um, and I think this, this here actually is very important, what Councillor Richard Williams is um, suggesting, because this isn't about um, sort of getting people to do things. It's about enabling people to help their communities and get involved in it themselves. So I'm fully supportive of it. Um, but those meetings that have been referred to, Chair, if we could look at, again, uh, looking at sort of population and size, because they have, by their nature, different, um, different issues. Thank you very much. So I'll be coming back to... Uh, Councillor Martin Kahn as the seconder of the motion. Um, Thank you, Councillor Kahn. Okay, um, I thoroughly approve of the attention given to biodiversity, and it's a matter which we're already actively uh, promoting, as has been explained. Uh, I've got a particular personal commitment to this, it's an area where I worked in, um, in local government for many years. Um, we've acted already to declare biodiversity emergency and one of the only 15% of councils in the UK have done so uh, and we promote doubling, the idea of doubling nature by 2050. Now that's a really big challenge, it involves, I worked it out, it involves adding roughly 250 hectares of new habitat, and natural habitat in a year in Cambridgeshire in addition to any existing natural habitat there is. And that's perhaps 50 hectares a year in South, in South Cambridgeshire itself. Um, biodiversity gain in major new developments will help, but, um, and we now have a new biodiversity SPD, but this won't be sufficient on its own. We, we can't do it on our own and we need new partners. Parish and town councils are essential partners and can be beneficiaries of, you know, and can help in this. They have a role of, in local planning, they can involve promoting biodiversity through their neighborhood plans. And many not councils have a, local councils have good knowledge themselves and have expertise in that field um, in their, among their local residents and among their councils themselves. And therefore, they're willing to help. They already support local action to protect nature and plant trees. For instance, my village, is in Limpington, uh, they have a, 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 a recently bought set-aside area and a, and a, lot, a, a wet meadow area. Uh, they've already got a community orchard and pocket park. So the, there are things they can do. But to ensure, you, uh, and as already mentioned, there is the, um, there's already been a local nature recovery toolkit provided, which is, uh, which is very helpful in this. So actually providing a toolkit in itself is probably not what's needed, but there is need perhaps for better information. It's clear from what people have said that people don't know where to go, and I'm sure that we can help uh, in improving that. Um, we, we run a grant scheme which provides opportunities through the zero carbon community grants. There's already been seven successful nature projects. Uh, and we do encourage applicants to refer to the toolkit tool kit on planning projects. We've also got specialist uh, staff who can help councils undertaking this role. Um, local councils have a range of powers. This includes uh, parish councils to protect and enhance nature, including the power to provide local nature reserves, which I was surprised to find that it covers them as well and to provide land for informal recreation. So they should be encouraged to use them. Lo local support is the best protection that, that local uh, natural habitats can have. Yeah. So we are reactive, but we, we, have always, uh, we have tended in the past to pass this, um, uh, re rely on others to provide this, these sort of services. And I hope that we can see more effort put into this in, in, in the future. Are you winding so, up, Councillor Carr? Uh, yes, I'm winding up. We, so I welcome this motion and I invite Chris, uh, Councillor Williams to apply his own enthusiasm to this and to join me in fighting for resources 
to, uh, to, to fight this corner and undertake all these tasks. Thank you, Councillor Khan. And Councillor Richard Williams, you've got three minutes to respond if you wish to. Thank you very much. Certainly very happy to accept that from, from Councillor Khan and thank Councillor Khan for um, seconding the motion. Um, I, I do just want to say that um, this is not meant to be an attack. It's not meant to be a criticism of what the Council is doing. Um, I, I, I should emphasise that, even though it comes from the opposition, it, it isn't meant to be an attack. Um, in a sense, though, when I say this in a friendly and constructive way, some of the contributions from Councillor Smith and Councillor um, Shumi Hawkins kind of show what I'm getting at. There's lots of different information in lots of different places. Councillor Hawkins referred to, you know, pages 26 and 27, I think you said, of the doubling nature strategy. This is about just putting it in a central place so that parish councils know exactly where to look, because we, we do have a lot of information there. It is in slightly different places. So this is pulling it together in a single source, organising it slightly differently, presenting it in a particular way. And as I say, I have been talking to Natural Cambridgeshire, and they've said, yeah, we can see the gap, and you know, we, we can put this together. Now, a lot of it could be signposting to this policy, that policy, the other policy, but it's in a place where it says, parish councils specifically address to parish councils and their, how they might go about fulfilling their legal obligations. So it, it really is to fill that gap and make a bridge not intended as an attack on anybody. Thank you, Councillor Williams. So, uh, we'll go to the vote on this. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor. May, may I just refer to the monitoring officer for a point of clarification, mm -hmm. please? So, um, so Councillor Williams has just, uh, I think, made it clear that this is about collating what's already there and making sure that it's accessible and available and that we're signposting. Um, are we confident that this motion isn't committing us to further expenditure, which I don't think a motion can do. Are we confident about that, please? Um, to Rory McKenna. I'm hoping it isn't. I'm hoping that, you know, it is just pulling everything together in the right place, making it easier to access. I'm going to slightly struggle to answer that question because I'm not the person who's going to have to put this all together. Um, now, it will depend on what is actually required to, to do that there. If there was going to be an expenditure involved, then I would probably recommend that this motion is passed over to Cabinet for that to be considered. But if, if we think that we can produce this guidance without um, um, doing that there, they say we could, um, and I'll put this out to, to members, you could amend the wording of the motion. So um, it does say, and just bear with me, um, in the last paragraph of the motion, it does talk about producing guidance. Uh, if that were changed to providing guidance, um, then I, I think that might solve the problem. So that makes sense. Providing. Um, I mean, so I think I think it's all there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, through you, Chair. I mean, I think I think it's there, or you know, or it is a work work in progress, either us or, or partners. Um, it's up so, to Councillor Williams whether he's happy with that um, slight word change. So the proposal is to change the wording in the third line of the no, final no, paragraph. No, no, it's not a proposal, it's a recommendation. Sorry, recommendation, thank you. Um, the recommendation would be, if um, Councillor Richard Williams accepted it, to change the wording in the middle and to say, as some other councils have done, to provide guidance for parish and town councils, etc. I'm that, perfectly that happy to accept that change. Splendid. Okay. So, with the amendment of that word, producing to providing, uh, shall we move to a vote? Then we're happy with that. Yeah. Councillor Khan is indicating that he's happy with that wording as well. Good. Okay. So that's. A result. Uh, and Councillor Williams, you've already summed up, so I think we move to a vote at this point. Chair, the, we don't currently have a seconder for the amendment, but I'll second the, the amendment by Councillor okay. Smith, just to make sure we are, are sticking to where we are. We can't... So, so technically, the amendment was suggested by the monitoring officer but perhaps councillor bridget smith is happy to well i think councillor williams was ha happy to propose it himself and i'm happy to second it is that no no it was being proposed right. by the one oh, just just tell just okay, tell me so what i need to do just please. be clear hang on 
folks, don't get carried away. It's proposed, if you like, by me and, se and seconded by Councillor Heather Williams and accepted as an, a reasonable amendment by Councillor, the, 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 the mover of the motion. Uh, perhaps I can't, Paul. It's, just, it's agreed. Okay, so this is now part of the amendment. That this amendment is part of the motion that we're now voting on. Are we okay with that? Agreed. Let me just check. Good. Okay, everybody's happy with that. Right, so we'll go to a vote then. Surely a, a motion is agreed by yourself, Chair, to be acceptable before the meeting. Yes, it was acceptable, yeah. but it was acceptable in the terms that it was something we could decide about. Yeah. But if the members don't have to agree that, it's for the members to do, discuss okay. that in debate, which is what I we've done. I thought the point was that it wasn't acceptable because we couldn't... You know, no, no, that's a different point. It, it was acceptable in the terms of our... Um, yeah. Standing orders. Yeah. But if the members choose to debate and feel that that wasn't acceptable to them, that's a different thing. Oh, right. And that's okay. why we take just, debate. Just and that's seems why we incredible have to me. So it's been accepted by yeah. the proposer of the motion. So all hunky dory. So shall we go to a vote then? Uh, actually, no. If we're, if we're all in agreement, let's do it by affirmation, folks. Right. Oh, lovely. Okay. We'll do it by affirmation. Um, so does anybody wish to object or abstain? No hands up. Great. So we'll do it by affirmation. Thank you. Lovely. So moving on to 18B, this is the motion from Councillor Heather Williams uh, that this council opposes congestion charging. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's one sentence, so hopefully there won't need to be an amendment to it. There are no budget requirements for it, so hopefully we'll be able to just debate the, uh, the motion. Um, so... Carry on, Chair. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so congestion charging at the moment, I think, would be the wrong move for us in Greater Cambridge. It is being discussed at the moment, which I think is why it's topical and should be brought forward at this time you know we we are looking at ever rising costs we've debated that very fully today but also there is a real and members of the gcp will know i've raised this before there is a real equalities issue and argument for me with this you know we don't currently have the local transport infrastructure that means if you're working a night shift as a porter in adenbrooks that you can get in and out without you know, with reliable, affordable public transport. So I think until we're at a situation where that is possible and people have a real opportunity to get out of cars and onto public transport, not like one of my villages where, well, several of them don't have buses at all and one of them very usefully has um, a bus to Royston but not from or vice versa. So you can get somewhere, but you can't get back, and, and vice versa. So until that really is sorted, up and running, and we've had some, some change, this just can't happen yet. And we do have a board member on the Greater Cambridge Partnership, and they are looking at these things. So I would really encourage people to support this and oppose congestion charging, um, especially at the moment. I think that's just all you're going to do is stretch that divide further and further on equalities grounds. Because by its nature and the cost of living, lots of people that work in the city have to move out of the city because they can't afford it. They might not have compliant vehicles because of the cost of them. So we're going to be, if we introduce congestion charging, we'll be penalising people for their financial position overall, in my view, because there is not the alternatives in place. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Do you have a seconder? So, Councillor Bygott, thank you. Do you wish to speak now or reserve? Yes, please. You wish to speak now? Yes. Okay, do go ahead. Thank you, Chair. South Cambridge is comprised, comprised of 103 villages and two towns. We are an overwhelmingly rural area, and it is res responsibility of this council to stand up for the countryside and the people living on our farms and in our villages. Every proposed scheme for congestion charge in Cambridge has included the rule that South Cambridgeshire residents pay full price 
while those in Cambridge City are exempt. In the countryside, driving is a necessity, whereas for many city dwellers, it's a luxury. Cambridge residents have buses and trains, they can walk or cycle, and they have lots of services nearby. Meanwhile, villages like Lulworth, Gravely, and Papworths and Agnes have no scheduled public bus service. And others, like Connington, have only two buses to Cambridge per day. How is it fair that these are the people who pay? How is it fair that tradespeople who have to pay in order to do their jobs? Some jobs can only be done from a van. Have you ever seen a tiler carrying 10 boxes of bathroom tiles on a bus? Most of the plumbing and electrical supplies shops are in Cambridge. Do we expect these shops to close down or to move elsewhere? Cities like Singapore, London and Stockholm already had amongst the best metro systems in the world before they introduced congestion charging. We don't have that level of infrastructure, but we should. The only way to solve congestion in Cambridge is with an underground metro system. South Cambridgeshire residents are to be punished for not using the public transport that hasn't been provided for us. We need to solve the underlying cause of congestion by improving public transport rather than punishing people with unfair taxes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bygott. Do you, uh, anybody else want to speak? Councillor Brian Mills, I can see. Councillor Goff first. Councillor Goff first, sorry, thank you. I'll come to you in a moment, Councillor Mills. Councillor Goff, Great. do you go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. So a, a number of options have been outlined by the GCP to free up road space to ensure that any improvements to public transportation are not negated by congestion and at the same time raise revenue to fund those very improvements in public transportation, including lower fares that, as the leader of opposition said, are obviously key to benefiting those on lower incomes and disadvantages than those who live in rural areas. At the GCP Joint Assembly and Board, it was pretty unanimous, and I believe the opposition leader spoke on this, about the support for better public transportation for our area. But then there is also a requirement to fund it on an ongoing basis and simultaneously to tackle congestion. Better public transportation, including lower fares, and options such as pollution charging, flexible pricing, workplace parking levies, are linked. One follows the other. That linkage between trans better transportation and funding mechanism and reducing congestion is critical and was a key issue which the Citizens Assembly addressed, and that was followed up by the Making Connections consultation initiated by the GCP at the end of 2021. We should support evidence-based policy making, as we've done in presenting the real policy options to residents and businesses who do recognise this linkage and its importance and who have engaged in the consultation. And I just note that many of the assertions which Councillor Bygot made about what form any charging should be are absolutely not present in the consultation, which reveals that he didn't participate in it. And it would be really advantageous if these views were conducted through that consultation process. Consequently, we should certainly wait to hear what the public has to say in response to the GCP consultation before taking any view on the best mix of measures. And this motion seems to be a very odd attempt to preempt that public input. And for that reason, we should reject it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Councillor Brian Mills. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in response to Councillor Bygott, um, Boris Johnson's bus back better plan in tatters as Treasury cuts funding by half. Thank you, Brian. Councillor Mills. Uh, Councillor Cohn. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I'll be brief. I was just going to say, obviously, I support this um, motion. Um, I can't um, support congestion charge, which I think will affect the very poorest um, people within my uh, ward. Um, and I just don't think it's fair um, that people that can't afford to, to live in the city um, that are commuting in are sort of 
lobbied with uh, a tax. These are the same people whose rent are, are going up and they're having to pay more on their council tax. Um, you know, I think there's only so much we can hit people, um, you know, on, on low incomes. Thank you very much, Councillor Cohn. So, uh, would you like to close the debate, Councillor Heather Williams? Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, this is obviously for this council um, not going to be a unanimous decision. Um, and uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop talking about it. And the consultation that was referred to, some of my parishes, the parish councils, didn't respond to the consultation. I have raised this with the Chief Executive of GCP because of the format of the consultation process itself. It wasn't designed for parish councils to respond in um, and such like. So I think that some of, I think we'll find that some of the consultation responses aren't, aren't really reflective 100% of our communities. Um, when I've spoken with people in my community and asked them, they're very much opposed to congestion charging. Some say maybe in the future, if there's a, if there's a better option, an alternative, but not now. And I think it's really important that, as Councillor Cohn said, we cannot keep putting more and more funds. And, and we're just keeping people in diesel and fossil fuel vehicles. We're keeping, if we, they're never going to be able to get out of that position, to be able to afford an electric van or anything else, if, if they're going to be getting hit with a congestion charge to go to and from work along with everything else. So I would really say on equality grounds, we should not be looking to, to bring in congestion charging at this time. It will affect those, those poorest in society. Thank you very much, Councillor Heather Williams. So I'm going to go to the vote now. Um, so those people who wish to agree with the vote, with the motion, uh, press green. Those who wish to object to the motion, press red. Those who wish to abstain, press yellow. Can I check if everybody has voted successfully? And but just as a matter of interest, you can tell what your vote is by the bar at the bottom, which shows you what which your vote, the vote that was recorded for you. Okay, so looks like everybody's voted. Uh, that gives 17 voting against, six voting in favour. That means that the vote, the, the motion falls. Thank you. So, should I say more correctly, the motion is lost. Moving on to 18C, standing in the name of Councillor Mark Howell. Councillor Howell, would you like to move your motion? Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, you'll be glad to know that I'm not going to be speaking for long on this, mainly because the battery's gone on my tablet with all my notes on. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like a cable to plug in with? <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, four and a half hours ago... Oops. Do you come want to speak now, Councillor Mills, or this is... No, it's later. Um, four, four and a half hours ago... Brian, Councillor Brian Mills might be offering you a cable. For no, 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 fine. For, <laughs> right, let's start again. So four and a half hours ago, we had a public question from Mr Littlewood, where he outlined his concerns with regards to CSET. So I'm here now with regards to my concerns. And they are basically that things have changed. Things have changed to the extent that the current proposals are no longer valid and no longer um, workable. And therefore, what we ask really, or what I am asking really, is for the GCP to relook at what they are doing under the new proposals, especially with the fact that they could be bringing up, turning up good prime, what I would call agricultural land. Uh, I will leave that there, and I'm happy to respond to at the end, then, um, Chairman, should there be any um, questions, Thank especially you, from Councillor Mills. Thank, Thank you, Councillor Hull. Is your motion seconded? I hope so, and I hope it's be by Councillor Cohn. Yeah, I'm happy to second the motion. You Chair. wish to speak now or reserve your right? Uh, I'm happy to reserve the right, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, we've got a request to speak from Councillor Fane. 
Councillor Fain, are you still there online? I am indeed, yeah. thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, um, I would just point out that this motion relating to CSET, CSET is of course more than just the busway, which is phase two. It also includes phase one, some important safety work going on on the 1307. But I'm going to assume this motion is not intended to deal with that. Um, I think it's well known that as councillors for the, for the Great Shelford and Stapleford for the Shelfords Ward, both Nick Sample and I share many of the concerns that were expressed this morning about the proposal for a bus road through the edge of the Gog Magog Chalk Hills landscape character area, i.e. through some of the finest countryside in the Cambridge Green Belt. Um, now, however, I want to speak more about the process than the than the merits of this or otherwise, because it is quite clear that following the findings of the inspector in the Stapleford Retirement Village appeal, uh, the exact route will have to be reviewed. Yes, will, not may, will have to be reviewed in the light of that decision. Um, and I understand the GCP may put a revised route to the Assembly possibly in June. The Assembly is, of course, as is the GCP itself, able to consider new factors under the DFT, Department for Transport, guidance on the procedure that was referred to earlier. And it will be up to GCP members what new factors to consider, whether they confine themselves to the exact route and look at the impact of that appeal decision, or whether they consider other factors, bearing in mind that at that stage, the Mayor's uh, local transport and communications plan will be probably about to go out to consultation. Now, we don't know whether that the outcome of that consultation will be relevant to the route, but we can't prejudge it and assume that it will not be relevant. So it is important that the Assembly is able to consider all of these factors and that the Board is able to consider the views of the Assembly. And I'm not keen on us as a Council seeking to mandate our GCP Board representative it is very important that that person is a representative, not delegate, and is able to consider all of these additional factors. Uh, whether they will remains to be seen. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Um, I'm going to take the next one from Councillor Neil Goff online, uh, but I'm, I'm mindful of people in the room too. Councillor Goff. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, so as the current uh, representative on the GCP board, I'll happily respond to this motion. Um, no transportation scheme is ever going to be universally welcomed. Um, there is a balance that has to be struck between the benefits of the scheme, um, the positive and negative effects on the environment, cost, deliverability and so forth. And the GCP is charged with doing that. Um, and the board has continually challenged the GCP organisation to ensure that any trade-offs are made in the best interests of everyone and mitigation measures are introduced wherever possible and as I answered in the question to Mr Littlewood this morning that is an ongoing process. The board has and will continue to push the GCP officers to deliver a scheme that delivers the strategic outcome required while minimising environmental impacts. Um, the scheme ultimately will be tested thoroughly and independently during the planning inquiry um, but as at the current time, I see absolutely no evidence that the CSET scheme is anything other than essential to cope with the growth in this corridor. And to simply oppose the scheme at this stage is inappropriate and wrong, and therefore we should reject the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Um, right, I'm just going to clarify who I've got on my list to speak, because <laughs> I'm getting all sorts of <laughs> semaphore from people in the room. So I have to speak. Firstly, Councillor Milnes, is that correct? Then Councillor Bygott, Councillor Richard Williams, and Councillor John Batchelor. Was there anybody else who wished to, and Councillor Heather Williams, okay. Uh, right, that's fine. So, so and Councillor Khan, okay. 
So, uh, Councillor Milnes, do go ahead. I would better use the abridged version then, but I still have my notes because I've brought paper to the letter. I, I'm just really disappointed about the political opportunism we see from the opposition. Because if we go back, we have uh, various... Mills, can you address your points to me, please? Yes, I can, Chair. I'm happy to do so. So the opposition uh, really perhaps uh, might remember their officers that were involved uh, in this project, who until very recently all supported the routes that they are now trying to object to. So we had Tony Orji, who chaired the local liaison forum through years of consultation exercises, uh, which I accompanied on um, all the time. Um, we had a councillor, Roger Hickford, you may remember he was a uh, county councillor, I think, for the same um, district that I, uh, division I, I now represent, who was a uh, member for the GCP, actually approved of this proposal. Um, James Palmer, the former mayor, was very much in um, favour of it. But yet we see them all now lining up to object to their own plan. And I just find that really quite awkward. Thank you, Councillor Milnes. Councillor Bygott. Thank you, Chairman. So, um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, James Palmer, um, in the previous um, motion I talked about the fact that we need to um, uh, build a metro system in Cambridge. And until we design a proper system, um, that will solve the problem properly rather than tinkering around the edges. Um, we need to know what that system is going to be like and um, how, it's, how it's going to be built. And anything that we build now without that knowledge could end up being a white elephant and not being able to con uh, connect properly. Now, Cambridgeshire used to have a very good uh, public transport system, part of which it no longer has, until someone called Dr. Beeching turned up. And one of the problems with Dr. Beeching leg Dr. Beeching's legacy is that we now have a whole lot of disused railways, and it seems that we are happily building all over them. So Trumpington Meadows built over the top of one, and uh, we lost one up to St. Ives, and now we're planning to build on, on top of another, uh, the Haverhill Railway. And in addition to that, we're also allowing blocks of flats, like the ones at Shelford, to be built I right next to the railway Councillor Bygott, you'll be addressing your, question, your points to me. Thank you. So we've been allowing um, blocks of flats in Great Shelford to be built right next to the railway line, and that means that we can now no longer widen that line, and it means that we can no longer have another uh, type of transport uh, come alongside the station at Great Shelford. And what that means is that we need to now sweep round through the countryside and lose more of our green fields because we're not planning with a proper long-term system. We have chaotic and haphazard development that is progressively making transport planning more and more difficult. So for these reasons, I support the railway line being rebuilt to Linton and Haverhill along its original uh, route past Grander Park. And I feel if we build the CSET proposal or any other strange hybrid bus, something this, something that, then we will lose, for the long term, the ability to rebuild our proper railway network as it once was. Thank you, Councillor Bygart. Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, obviously, my, my ward, is, this doesn't touch my ward, but it's very, very close to my ward. Um, there is something that's changed since these plans were first developed, and that's COVID, and that has changed travelling and commuting patterns and the number of people who actually travel to work. We don't fully know yet what the impact will be, how long-term the shift to home working, or rather how long the shift to home working will endure, but I think there is good evidence that it will have a, a permanent effect. And this will have substantially changed travel patterns. So I don't think it is unreasonable. In fact, I think it is essential that plans 
that, like this that predate COVID are reviewed and reassessed. Now, Councillor Fane, I understand the difficult position Councillor Fane is in here, but you know, Councillor Fane, I think, give a very good summary of the environmental impact of this proposal, which does cut through um, some of the best, I would agree with his comments, some of the best Greenbelt um, countryside that we have. It's very intrusive. Now, it makes sense to review and to see if, given the changes that are likely in travel patterns, that another route might, in fact, be a better route. Absolutely. And that route could be... So yes, yeah, through you, Chair. Um, could be an on-road route, which would be less environmentally damaging. Basically, the cost-benefit analysis changes. So I do support uh, this motion, and I will just add a small point of, of local interest, although not directly relevant to CSEF. There is also, or has been, a travel hub proposed in my ward at Whittlesford, which seems to be kind of going nowhere at the moment because it's waiting on the outcome of the A505 study. Um, and, you know, the A505 and the GCP are sort of waiting for, for one or the other of them to move. A question I often get asked is, well, has the GCP taken account of travel patterns, changes in travel patterns because of COVID? Will this affect their plans? It's a perfectly reasonable point. It's a point that many residents make to me and therefore, I think it is perfectly reasonable of us to say, actually, we're not sure that this is the right route now. The costs and benefits may have changed, and it should be reviewed, um, and I will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor John Batchelor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you. Uh, as the member for Linton, uh, and living within sight of the A1307, I'm more than aware of the issues on this corridor. There's major problems, major problems of congestion, of pollution, and most importantly, serious safety concerns. We need to provide an option so that people can get around without getting into their cars. Although there are people with concerns quite understandable concerns about CSET. There are also many people, such as those who work at the biomedical campus, who think that CSET offers the chance of a real improvement in their lives. I'm talking about people who can't work from home, essential workers who work long shifts, nurses, cleaners, porters, lab and admin staff, the people at Adam Brooks Hospital who book you in, ensure the hospital's clean, wheel patients down to theatre. High property prices have forced many to live some distance from Cambridge, in Linton, in Haverhill, and even further afield. 24% of people working at Adam Brooks approach using the SE Southeast Corridor and 21% of patients do so. There are very few reliable public transport options. Most of these people have to drive to work only to get stuck in traffic and pay high parking charges. What they need is a reliable, quick transportation, and this is what CSET offers. This motion dismisses the need for these residents, and I don't feel that is right, so I will be voting against. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor John Batchelor. Councillor Heather Williams, uh, I just want to point out the last person I'm taking questions from, uh, an observation from, is Councillor Khan. So, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, unlike Councillor Howell, the iPad has now given up, so I'm referring back to written notes. Um, so I think on listening chair to some of what's been said by the debate, I think we just, we just need to realise that circumstances change and we need to reflect those. You know, <laughs> reference has been made to other councillors or other party members that I'm, I represent the same party of. You know, we're talking about the longest political party in history. 
things will have changed and will have moved on, that what we do today will not necessarily match what we did 10, 15 or, you know, 20 years ago or 100 years ago. And I think if we, if we work on this basis that we're bound forever and never allowed to change our mind, then what, what's the point? What's the point of us being here? Um, we need to listen to people and we need to reflect that. And sometimes we need to say, do you know what? We, need to, we had an idea and we need to change it because it's not working. I don't think there's any embarrassment about that. I think it's a pragmatic and sensible approach. And I think that's exactly what's happening here with CSET. Circumstances have changed. Councillor Fain listed many ways that it has. There are other options available now. It doesn't need to be segregated because the metro is gone. We could have it on road. We can open up the railway line. I agree that there is a need for something in this area. I don't think any of us disagree with that. But what's currently being proposed is not right at this time in that area. And you know, a lot of reference in this debate by some has been made around party politics. I would just remind people that residents really will not be looking today at what party brought a motion. They'll be looking at the wording of the motion and what that means for them. So I would encourage members to look at the words of it, not just the party of which the motion is written, because residents won't thank you for it if you just take it on that basis. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, um, to correct what I said before, I will take the questions, the points from Councillor Khan and from Councillor Bridget Smith. So, Councillor Khan. Um, when, when I saw this motion was coming up, I thought, I don't, how much do I know about the area uh, and what, what it's going to, even though many years ago I did live in Sawston, so, and generally the area. Uh, uh, and I thought, well, I'd better have a look at the map. So I got out my 21 to 25,000 map, tried to look at the alignment that it was proposed, looked at alternative alignments to see whether this was better or worse, what was the opportunity. And as has been commented, it's very difficult to find a good alignment that brings in uh, the Shelfords and Sawston and Linton and all the different communities on the route and gets a, uh, uh, and is in a suitable location. Now, as well. Criticisms of the covenant alignment, that it goes around the current communities, it's on the edge of the communities, and that one perhaps is justified, but I didn't see anything very much better than alternative. What this motion proposes, it says it does not support the current proposals. Now, it may be that these are not the best proposals, but this is actually rejecting them. Now, it may not be really the best, but it may be that they are, in fact, the best com compromise that you could get. This proposal says we don't support them. We, we will ne on no account support the existing line. I think that is tying ourselves to the future. Um, until we know more about what the future situation is going to be in terms of employment, we do, what we, is certain is we need fast, good access to the, with public transport to the south. If we could have any hope of change, having the necessary mode change to reduce congestion in the city. Therefore, uh, I think we just need to keep an open mind on this. I don't, uh, I, I think this one ties us far too much. Um, it may be that this isn't the one, and when it comes to a public inquiry uh, uh, about a, a proposal, that we, it, people can show a better alternative. But at this stage, I don't think we should tie ourselves to the future, and I think it's voting against. Thank you very much, Councillor Khan, and Councillor Bridget Smith, because um, it's, it's fine, speak. actually. Councillor right. Khan's made such good points, and it's so flipping late that I will, I will <laughs> hold my own counsel and we'll get to a vote. Thank you very much. In that case, members, um, we'll come back to Councillor Mark Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Much appreciated. Oh, sorry, just one moment. We'll come back to Councillor Cohn and then Councillor Howell. Yeah, I, I mean, I think all the points, um, you know, have been raised as to why, you know, I would support this bit. Uh, uh, motion. Um, I think, you know, there's many, many reasons and things that have, have changed that, you know, illustrate why we should hit the pause button on this project and uh, avoid carving up very, very beautiful green belt um, unnecessarily, potentially. So um, that's why I support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Cohn. Councillor Howell. Thank you once again, Chairman. Chairman, um, I am not trying to stop CSAT, and far from it. I just believe that the current proposals and the now the new circumstances which we've come up with, we now know 
with regards to, um, uh, it's already mentioned with regards to the um, pandemic and also the Cambridge Autonomous Network. I don't think at the moment the current proposals are correct. With regards to the um, previous councillors in that particular patch, Councillor Orgy was four years ago, and I think Councillor Hitchford, I think off the top of my head, was eight years ago. Things changed quickly, and that things have changed over that particular time. But, and I've listened very carefully to what other people have said, very carefully to me, but the one phrase that I will now remember, that I will take away from you, isn't something that was said here, it was said something by Councillor Fain, when he says, and I'm paraphrasing, this is some of the best greenbelt land in Cambridgeshire. And that is the reason that I will be voting um, for this motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Howell. So we're going to move to a vote. So members, if you wish to support the motion, uh, indicate with the green button. If you object to the motion, indicate with the red button. And if you wish to abstain, uh, with the yellow. Yes, it has one person who has not yet voted. Can Democratic Services tell me whether that's... Good, okay, we've now got all 23 voted. Uh, there are six in favor and 17 uh, against, so that motion falls. Thank you, members. The final item on the agenda is on page Roman eight of the agenda and it indicates the chair's engagement. I simply wanted to add that in addition to those listed there, I also attended on the 3rd of October the Justice Service for the County of Cambridgeshire uh, at Ely Cathedral. Thank you, members. Thank you very much for staying with us to the end, and we finish now at 19.20. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Chair, very much. Thank you, Vice-Chair.